The Senate will adjourn and this is when we'll get to see senators start speaking on the floor. A lot of senators want to leave their mark on this trial. They want to finally have a chance to talk after having to sit still and quiet for several weeks. So for the next two days, we'll hear probably very eloquent, developed speeches from senators about why they're going to vote to remove the president or why they're going to vote to acquit him. And then this all leads up to Wednesday when the big vote happens at 4 p.m. So, Anita, the vote to block new evidence um, on Friday was a big win for uh, the president's team. Now, the Democrats are sort of characterizing that a little bit as proof that this was not a legitimate trial. So, I'm curious about the closing arguments for uh, the defense, for the president's team. How are they going to capitalize on that vote on Friday? Well, I don't think they're going to do much different than what they did in their opening remarks or their opening statements. Um, remember, they're feeling confident now because this was the big question, whether there would be witnesses. They're feeling confident about acquittal. So you're going to hear some of those same arguments. There was a lot of back and forth before the last week and the week before about, you know, is this legitimate and did they have to have evidence? I just don't think they're going to address that issue. They know there's not going to be any other witnesses. There's not going to be other evidence. What they're going to say is, as the evidence has shown, you know, he didn't do this and they don't think it's an impeachable uh, offense. So you're going to hear both of those arguments with that confidence, knowing that they, they are likely to have acquittal. Hmm. Uh, so, Natalie, as you know, a number of Republican senators have come out and they have criticized the president's actions in Ukraine. Of course, we know that most will vote to acquit him on Wednesday. Um, I wonder, are you hearing uh, senators still echoing the president's line that the call with Volodymyr Zelensky was a perfect call, or um, are you hearing, for the most part, that they are all in agreement that it was inappropriate, that he may have even crossed the line, but it wasn't impeachable and certainly not a cause to remove him? You really see different buckets of Senate Republicans here. You see the Senate Republicans that say there was nothing wrong with this call, it's fine. Most don't use the word perfect, but many will say the president did nothing wrong, he was investigating corruption. That's, say, the Ted Cruz, Mike Braun camp, Kevin Kramer. These are Republicans from red states. Then you have Republicans like Senator Joni Ernst, who yesterday said she would not call the, she would not class say the call was perfect, but she doesn't say it's impeachable. And a lot of Republicans will point to the high bar of voting to remove a president and say that the president's actions, while they may concern those senators, they don't rise to the bar of impeachment and removal of the president. So, Anita, the president is scheduled to deliver the State of the Union address uh, tomorrow. We know that his desire was to have the impeachment trial already wrapped up before he uh, delivered that address, but it won't. The final vote will be the following day. So I'm sure that will be on his mind as he's delivering uh, the message and as Americans are listening. But I'm wondering if you think the impeachment trial will have any sort of impact on the way he crafts his message. Well, even when we realized that this was going to, you know, go into this week and it would, you know, the State of the Union would be right in there on Tuesday, White House officials were saying that, you know, he's not going to address the impeachment. That doesn't mean he might not mention it, but the bulk of the speeches is designed to be an, uh, what they're calling, their theme is, an American comeback. So he's going to talk a lot about issues, which is generally what a State of the Union is, right? So he'll talk about the economy a lot. That's the thing that he wants to really drill home this, this year, uh, that the economy he's doing well, and he would like to take credit for that in the re-election campaign. But he'll also talk about health care and immigration, um, you know, trade, some of those other issues. So he's going to talk a lot about his achievements. There might be some veiled references. But remember, this is one of the very rare speeches that the president gives where he actually reads from the teleprompter. It's a speech that they've been crafting for weeks now, uh, not knowing exactly the timing of the, of the impeachment trial um, that's going to be filled with policy. And so so he might give some, uh, you know, make a reference to it, but I don't think it'll dominate. And he definitely uh, hasn't ad-libbed the last few years, so um, I don't expect it to be a huge, a huge uh, thing. But you know, everybody in that room's got to be thinking about it, and of course he will be too because it's just coming at such an awkward time. Mm -hmm. So that's a good uh, point, um, Natalie. I, I wonder, uh, given what the president said over the weekend uh, in his Super Bowl interview, that he doesn't feel that he can even work 
with Democrats. Um, mm -hmm. We know that at the State of the Union, uh, there are cheers, and when you don't like something, you sit in stony silence. Um, yes. Will there be any moment? I mean, the president in this speech, uh, if he doesn't sort of talk about unity amongst uh, both Republicans and, and Democrats, could there will there be any moment that Democrats will clap for anything, or will the entire thing be you know stony silence? And um, you know, given that in the past, uh, for example, in the last administration, somebody basically shouted out that President Obama was a liar. Mm -hmm. Could we see you know something a moment like that? I'm, I'm going to throw in my guess for bipartisan clapping or approval. It's probably going to be the USMCA. Yeah, that, yes. that's probably yeah. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you What are you hearing? USMCA will definitely get claps and applause. Both Democrats and Republicans are proud of getting that done. If he mentions criminal justice reform, which he highlighted in his Super Bowl ad, that was a bipartisan deal. I'm remembering last year there was some applause by Democratic women when the president accidentally kind of referred to them and they <laughs> got excited. So you could have moments like that. That's where Nancy Pelosi's famous like clapping moment happened. Um, and we saw the Democratic women wear white. So you may have moments like that where there's awkward applause or there's cheering. It's always a moment where lawmakers like to put their emotions right out on their face and let it be seen. So I'm sure we'll have some key moments that happen. And Nancy Pelosi sitting right behind the president, who she just tried to remove from office, is going to be quite a moment. Yeah, for um, sure. Nelly, I want to ask you about an announcement that CPAC made that uh, they are no longer inviting Senator Mitt Romney to um, this conservative gathering. Of course, CPAC, mm -hmm. the Conservative Political Action Conference, it's in reaction to his criticism of the president during this impeachment process. Um, I, I'm really curious, like, what do you think that says about the Republican Party or conservatives in this country? And what, have this, has, has there been any pushback to that announcement? Well, I was remembering how several years ago when Donald Trump was a candidate, he wasn't invited to CPAC. Right. And now CPAC has completely embraced really the Trump conservative wing of the Republican Party and pushed that forward. Mitt Romney is in a unique spot. Mitt Romney is not going to likely run for president again. Mitt Romney has five more years before he needs to consider running for office again, or four. But he... He's in a unique spot, too, where he's in Utah, where while Donald Trump isn't well-liked there, they, uh, even though they are very conservative, they don't necessarily like his policies. And so it really is a fight between, say, a Utah Mitt Romney Republican versus Donald Trump, and we're still waiting to see where that goes. And I, when I talk to a lot of Republicans, they often say that the outcome of the fall in November, whether Donald Trump wins re-election, will really determine where the Republican Party goes. If he wins four more years, he will essentially solidify the Trump Republican voice. But if if Trump loses re-election and you see different Republicans rise up, we may have that debate once again. Hmm. Is is the is CPAC, Natalie, still, though, a place? I mean, I, I think it's interesting that you point out that the president wasn't invited uh, uh, before he became a viable candidate to that because it was a place where fiscally conservative, socially conservative Republicans, uh, like, oh, Mitt Romney, right. <laughs> would do very, very well uh, in, in that crowd. And now it seems as if it's become simply just a place where um, people loyal to the president of the United States, no matter what he says, no matter what he does, no matter what his fiscal policies are that go against what has been a typical Republican ideal of the economy, not to take away from some of the strengths of the economy, but the fact that uh, we've got a ballooning deficit, for example, which would have been an, an anathema to a uh, conservative Republican many years ago. That So the question becomes, and does CPAC actually carry the same weight that it did pre-Donald Trump with, you know, perhaps maybe independent-minded uh, Republicans um, in, in, in Congress? CPAC is definitely... People who go to the CPAC, they're conservatives. These aren't swing voters. These are people who really are supportive of the president right now. But it, you do reflect a wider debate within the Republican Party. I mean, the care and concern we've seen over the deficit and the nation's debt in the Republican Party has faded over the past few years. We don't see the same 
energy and concern over that. Now, if a Democrat wins president, there's a lot of speculation that the volume on that concern may be turned up because Democrats are talking about larger programs that would expand government. But right now, we've seen de Republicans being willing to support legislation that does extend the nation's de debt. So that debate in the Republican Party over debt and that heightened volume has really faded. Anita, I want to ask you a question um, about something that Vlad brought up. He talked about the interview that the president did with Hannity and how the president mentioned that he doesn't see, he doesn't think he can you know, work with Democrats moving forward. Um, and he was, it was very personal. He, mm -hmm. he, you know, he suggested, he said essentially that the Democrats will do anything to win, even if it means dis being dishonest in regards to the impeachment. And it's clear that he's taking the impeachment process very personally and has developed some, or at least the way he speaks, it seems that he has developed some um, very personal uh, feelings, personal feelings, that doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. but strong Animus. feelings about certain mm -hmm. people, you know, uh, Adam Schiff being, uh, Schiff being one of them. Um, I'm wondering, moving forward after this, this is a president that at times has certainly displayed an ability to hold grudges. Um, do you think that the president will sort of hold it against the Democrats that, he, you know, they try to impeach him? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the, the comment was that surprising. If, if you remember right before the House, uh, you know, after the election in the midterm elections, before the Democrats took over the House, he was asked something similar, made a remark after, after they won an election, and he uh, kind of said, well, if they go after me, if they go after these investigations, of course, we didn't know about Ukraine then, and we didn't know about impeachment, uh, he's going to have a hard time working with them, is what he said. Um, I sort of took him at his word there, but, you know, we saw last year prior to the impeachment that they did have some meetings, right? Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi came over to the White House. There were some meetings with the president, and invariably, every single meeting ended up with some kind of blow-up. You know, the president walked out, the speaker walked out, uh, there were some arguments. Uh, you know, we saw some of those uh, because the president opened them up to cameras. So, uh, you know, it hasn't been the best relationship. And I have to say, in the last few weeks since the House voted and then this trial began, uh, just talking to people that are close to the president, and they say that he's been very, very angry, as you mentioned. It's very uh, personal to him. Very, He's very angry about it. And he has a drive that, you know, he's always sort of driven, but he has a more energy than he's had, they say, to, uh, you know, defeat them uh, in 2020, both with the presidential race, uh, try to get back as many House seats as they can. And so it's really that drive that's carrying him through this year. So I think it's going to be very difficult for him to work with them. Uh, that being said, both Democrats and Republicans have uh, a vested interest to try to get something done, to show voters uh, in November that they can legislate, that they can pass things. Uh, the USMCA, the trade agreement with Mexico and Canada, is a perfect example. It was uh, signed, it was, uh, you know, passed by the, by the House, both chambers, during impeachment. So, um, you know, they have an interest there to get something done, and I think you'll see them try, but it's going to be very difficult. Mm. Um, and Natalie, uh, you know, jumping off that, the fact that the president has been known to uh, be vindictive, in fact, he's talked about that in his books and, you know, the, that he goes after people that go after him, his supporters. Counterpuncher. Uh, uh, counterpuncher, his supporters like that. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, though, um, a, a, Dr. Jill Biden, the former vice president's wife, gave an interview to CNN, and she was asked about, for example, Senator Lindsey Graham, who the Bidens counted as friends. Um, many senators, Republican and Democrats, uh, counted Joe Biden as a friend before he became the vice president. Obviously, he sat in that chamber for many years and built up relationships mm -hmm. on both sides of the aisle. Now you've got Lindsey Graham suggesting that even after all of this is over, they're going to continue to investigate the allegations uh, that, let's be clear to our viewers, have proven nothing as far as uh, anything illegal or wrongdoing. Dr. Biden saying that, you know, she thinks that Lindsey Graham has changed. What are you hearing from others in the Republican Party, in the Senate, in Congress, are they privately saying to you, yeah, you know, Joe Biden's a good guy, but when it comes to the politics of all of this, we've got to go with the party, we've got to go with the president. But yeah, we think Biden didn't do anything wrong, but that's not how I can present it um, to the cameras. Are you hearing any of that? 
When Congress feels deeply partisan right now, it's an election year, and Lindsey Graham has said several times he's mad that only Republicans are being investigated, and he wants to investigate Donald Trump, or he wants to investigate the Bidens and based on these accusations. That's not exactly true. There were several congressional oversight investigations during the Obama administration. We saw investigations into the attack on Benghazi. We saw the Fast and Furious investigation. However, in deeply partisan times, it seems like Republicans feel like they want to defend their own. They are upset about these allegations. It strikes me that something that Donald Trump was trying to get done, trying to get Ukraine to do, to public, publicly announce these investigations in Kiev, to start something possibly against a pol political rival, he's now gotten Republicans in Congress to want to go after, um, which is, brings it much more closer to home. Except that when you get a, a member of Congress essentially saying uh, that part of the reason they even launch these investigations or they're thinking about launching these investigations is that they have successfully tied Joe Biden to some type of corruption that, again, let's point out, uh, was not proven at all to be uh, illegal. They gave that away, much in the same way that I believe it was Kevin McCarthy a couple of years ago in the point that you made about investigations into uh, Democrats, Natalie, when he went before the cameras and said, look, we got the Benghazi hearings started because we wanted to drag uh, Hillary Clinton's momentum. Um, so yeah. are voters going to fall for the same thing over again? Senator Joni Ernst came to the cameras last week, and she's a senator Republican from Iowa, and she said I, it was right after the Trump defense team did a whole outline on uh, Hunter Biden and the allegations and such like that, that again, the Bidens deny any wrongdoing there, and there's nothing there, or nothing yet to be seen there, but they... Joni Ernst was like, I hope that okay. Iowa voters listen to that. And so it does raise the specter of will voters care? Will voters maybe worry that this could tr chase Joe Biden and come up later in October, just like they were with Hillary Clinton's emails, where there was no wrongdoing there either? So we'll have to see how Democratic yeah. voters who polls show are primarily very interested in finding a candidate who can beat Donald Trump. We'll have to see how they take this into consideration. All right. Uh, Anita Kumar and Natalie Andrews, always great to have both of you. Thank you so much for your reporting. Uh, real quickly, we are just looking there at Senator uh, John Kennedy, yeah. uh, who is speaking to some reporters there. He's walking away. away, but we'll keep an eye on a camera there on the Hill as senators begin to arrive. So uh, we may cut to that if there's a moment that we think uh, you will find interesting and insightful. Uh, let's bring in CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman in the meantime. Good to see you, Ricky. Nice to see You've you. Been patiently uh, standing by oh, as I we got go through great the, information. I know. Natalie all of our and viewers. Anita are so good at sort of breaking it down and giving us insight from what their sources are telling them. Now, for the legal perspective, um, so there are a few Republican senators that are coming out and criticizing. President Trump's actions, as you know, they're declining to say it reaches uh, the standards of impeachment or at least of removal. The president has been impeached. Um, but I wonder, uh, what should we make um, of these admissions? What should we make when more information comes out uh, from either Ambassador Bolton or from others who have uh, information that did not make it into the Senate trial because there were no witnesses allowed and no new evidence was allowed? Does that have any bearing at all moving forward? Yes, of course it has bearing, but not in the Senate. Um, let me do both parts of your question. Uh, the political question is about senators now making statements, uh, whether it is just coming over to the microphone or whether it's going on the Sunday shows or making comments here and there, uh, not only uh, over the weekend, but before the vote. I mean, we certainly had heard from Lamar Alexander. We certainly uh, had heard more from Lisa Murkowski before the vote. And that's really a political judgment. Lamar Alexander, not so political in the sense that he's not running for re-election, but he definitely wanted to get his say in, which was this was inappropriate, this was bad, but it did not warrant removal. Why? Because he believed that things should go to the ballot box. When you go to Lisa Murkowski or you would get to someone like a Susan Collins or a Mitt Romney, that has to do with elections. So let me move on to the legal in the second part of your question. Um, John Bolton. It is hard to believe that we did not get to hear from John Bolton. And I say that 
not from a Democrat versus a Republican perspective, but from the polling that was done of the American people, that you had 75 percent or thereabouts of American people polled, said that they wanted to hear from witnesses. And of course, this little drip, drip, drip about John Bolton's book and the revelations therein whether it came out of people in the White House, whether it came from people who reviewed it, or whether it came from Bolton's people, to me is frankly irrelevant. It's the question of what the information was. So where do we go? We wind up back in the House. Uh, we see Senator Pat Leahy there taking some questions. Guys, do we want to listen in or? Not today. Let's but listen I'm, to I Senator Pat Leahy. He's I great. what they're doing is uh, uh, some of the leadership will be speaking at the shortly before the final vote, and uh, as dean of the Senate, I'll, I'll speak, and it'll probably be myself, Senator Durbin, and uh, Senator Schumer on our side. Do you believe that tomorrow night, since the Senate won't have voted, do you believe that there is an opportunity here for the president to say something? Uh, Bill Clinton took sort of responsibility for what after he was impeached. Do you think there's an opportunity there? And if you think there's an opportunity, do you I, think I've the president never. will take it? I've never seen uh, President Trump take responsibility for anything, no matter uh, of any of his misstatements or anything else he's done wrong. Uh, he is not one that takes responsibility. Is that too subtle? No, no. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So there is Senator Pat Leahy there taking a couple of questions. Uh, uh, we well, hang on. Let's just let's. <laughs> Oh, that's there's listening. an opportunity for the president to say something tomorrow, possibly stating the union, taking responsibility, up, like the way kind of Bill Clinton did. Like, I might not have had a perfect phone call. I might have done something wrong. Well, I have I, no idea what he'd say. Do I really you, do don't. Do you think maybe, you would, like, maybe it would yeah. help if he, the Senate heard that? Or well, I learned a, one thing I learned early on with, the, with this president. Uh, his instincts are pretty good in spite of the fact nobody agrees with him. But uh, so I would not advise him either way. Is saying that you're, he's not willing to work with Democrats now because well he he's going to work with Democrats. He does a good job of it. He said on the, in the interview yesterday. That okay, he well I don't, I don't think he's going to say that. He, I think he's going to. He, he, he'll be that very, okay. He's he's going to make a good speech, and uh, let's just leave it. Thank you, Senator. We'll keep an eye out as yeah. more senators make their way to the microphones there to answer questions, uh, both Democrat and Republican. So, Ricky, we were talking about uh, about the the work that remains. Should more revelations come to light? Well, if more revelations come to light, a perfect example, of course, is the drip drip that I mentioned about uh, John Bolton's book. The other is that it came out that there are a number of redacted emails having to do with the president uh, dealing with the question of withholding aid from the Ukraine, um, excuse me, from Ukraine. And I will never make that mistake mm -hmm. again because I have been corrected. Mm -hmm. And of course, my ancestry is from Ukraine. Mm. Um, that uh, that information goes to the House of Representatives. And if uh, Adam Schiff decides that the House Intelligence Committee should hold further hearings, whether it's now, whether it's post-election in November, or whenever it may be, about what else went on there. Um, the Senate is done. We are done. Mm. They're going to make their closing arguments. We know basically what they're going to say. I am sure that Adam Schiff will be uh, fiery and brilliant on his side, and the president's attorneys will be fiery and brilliant on their side. Then you wind up with the senators making speeches about um, their position or about their vote, and you can understand they've had to be silent, like a jury uh, would be silent, and jurors have often but, wanted to but speak. But I just have a quick question to what you just said about those redacted emails. I mean, if the Senate has said that the call with Volodymyr Zelensky was in their minds, the Republican senators have said that it was about the president rooting out corruption in Ukraine and that the call may have been problematic, but it's certainly not impeachable, uh, it's certainly not a cause to remove the president of the United States. Why are they worried about emails that would just 
add fuel to what the Democrats say is wrongdoing, but the Republicans say isn't. But, in other words, like, what are you trying to hide? But They've already said you're good to go. That's been the counter argument through this whole thing, right? right? If there's nothing, if there's nothing to hide, then why not let John Bolton talk? Why not let others talk who were in the room when it happened right. or whatever? Right? But now, illegally speaking, Ricky, you're going to be cleared. So why are you worried about what comes out? They've already said it's okay. Well, I think it's embarrassing. Um, mm. I think that uh, if you have been a public servant who has gone to the hallowed halls of the Senate, the august body of the Senate, you have voted that you will hear no more witnesses and no more evidence that Mitch McConnell has uh, banged the gavel and said the evidence is closed. There was a good reason for him to do that because there may be other information out there. So uh, it may become publicly embarrassing to someone who particularly who has to face their constituency for the election in November mm. and say that they didn't want to hear or see. You know, it's see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Mm -hmm. And and I think that uh, they know they have to answer to to the American public. Well, there's good reason for them to be concerned that perhaps their vote um, may have been along party lines and maybe they felt that he should not be removed. But nevertheless, the idea of closing down evidence, no documents or witnesses, is a far cry from a final vote of acquittal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so to that, you know, there's been a lot, uh, we've talked a lot about what this means for future imp in, uh, impeachments, you know, what sort of precedents being set. In, specifically in regards to what rises to the level of impeachment, but what about not allowing additional information or witnesses? Does that have an impa impact on future impeachments? Or since we've only had three, is each one so different that who knows what the next one could be like? Well, you could say who knows what the next one, heaven forbid that there is a next one, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be like. But as you can recall, when we were before the Senate Judiciary Committee and we dealt with the constitutional law professors, that they all looked at precedent. Amy Hang Klobuchar. On. Uh, yeah, let's listen to Senator Klobuchar. I'm a mom. I can do two things at once. And so I'll be headed back to Iowa and uh, just with our, was with our team late last night. We've had huge events um, wherever we go. And uh, we're feeling good about the surge we're seeing. What's your plan? So this will wrap up around 4 o'clock and you jet off to the... I go back and then I'm there uh, with, our, with our team. And then we go to New Hampshire directly from there at like midnight. Get in at, I don't know, 3.30 in the morning and do several events the next day. Uh, well, I am really excited about how we're doing right now. A few points away from people you guys talk about a lot. And um, I, in a number of polls last week, I was at number three. Um, so we're just keeping on going. I'm punching way beyond my weight. When you look at the money that people are spending, uh, we have been much more frugal. And it's one of the reasons that I'm still standing. And I think a lot of people predicted uh, when I was in that blizzard that I wasn't even going to make it through my announcement, much less to this point in the campaign. So uh, we keep going. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, it looks like Amy Close, Senator Amy Close, is trying to find the door there. How do you get back? In, how do you get back in there? Um, she should know. She spent an awful lot of time during the week in there, and so everything's supposed to get underway really in a minute or so. So yeah. we're watching as soon as they gavel in. We will uh, take you to the floor of the Senate. But we were talking about sort of the implications of this impeachment process, how it may impact future impeachments, whether it's no, not allowing witnesses, not feeling it necessary to allow witnesses or additional uh, evidence as it starts to become uncovered and it is pertinent to, pertinent to the subject matter. Everything creates a precedent mm -hmm. when you are looking at only three. Um, because if, as I say, heaven forbid there's another one, this one will be cited just like Nixon and Clinton and Johnson. Mm -hmm. All right, we're about 10 seconds away from a CBS News special report as the Senate reconvenes for closing arguments. Here we go. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell in Washington. It is the start 
of an historic week. In just a few moments, the Senate impeachment trial resumes at the Capitol. Later tonight, the first votes that count in the presidential campaign and tomorrow, President Trump's State of the Union address. Right now, the House managers and the president's defense team are about to deliver their closing arguments. Now, each side will get up to two hours and then the trial will adjourn. Senators will get their chance to speak in regular sessions. So we will hear a number of speeches explaining their votes. And then the final vote on removing the president will come late Wednesday afternoon. We're learning this morning that the White House is feeling extremely confident that the president will survive the Senate vote, especially after senators voted on Friday not to call additional witnesses. Let's go straight to Capitol Hill and Nancy Cordes, who's there. And Nancy, lay out what we're expected to see today. Nora, I think you'll hear the House impeachment managers lament the fact that witnesses are now not going to be called as part of this trial. They will likely lay out all the things that the Senate could have learned if individuals like John Bolton had been subpoenaed to testify. And I think you're going to hear them expound on an argument that they started to make last week, that this trial and the final vote on acquittal or removal will have something of an asterisk next to it for posterity that it won't be a, a, a fully official vote because the Senate took it without knowing all the facts. Obviously, the president's lawyers will argue the opposite, but I think that's what you're going to hear from these House managers. They know that the votes are there for acquittal, but they want to make this as difficult a vote for Senate Republicans as possible. All right, Nancy, stand by. I want to bring in our panel here. Jeff Flake is a CBS News political contributor and former Republican senator from Arizona. Thanks for being here. Be our here. legal analyst, Jonathan Turley, a constitutional law expert, and White House correspondent, Paula Reed, who also covers the Justice Department for us and is a lawyer. And, Paula, I know you've been speaking with uh, members, uh, uh, people at the White House and connected with the, um, the president's defense team. What are you hearing this morning? They're telling me they feel confident, and that's quite a change from last Monday, where they were anything but confident following the disclosures from Bolton's forthcoming book. And they say today they're not intending to relitigate the facts of this case. Instead, they want to focus on the constitutional issues. They're really looking towards the historical record. We can expect to hear from the president's two lead attorneys, Jay Sekulow, Pat Cipollone. They may allow some of the deputies, some of the other folks to speak to, but they don't actually intend to take uh, their whole two hours. It's interesting. I've spoken with so many of these same officials before these big moments, before the Mueller report for other investigations. And I can tell you now that we're on the other side of this decision over witnesses, they don't seem to be sweating today too much. I, I must ask you, Senator, how do you see um, your former colleagues? I know you're still friendly with many of those senators right. up there on the Hill. And we have at least now, I would count about half a dozen right. Republican senators who have expressed publicly that the president's actions were inappropriate, right. um, were wrong, but not enough to remove him from office. I'm speaking about Lamar Alexander. Right. I'm speaking about Marco Rubio, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, and others. Mm -hmm. And there will be more. And, yeah. and, and frankly, in my view, that's a good thing. Um, it's been needed for a while. I think Senate Republicans don't want to be seen like House Republicans, where they all said the call was perfect, the president did nothing wrong. That just falls so squarely outside of the facts that it's just not credible. So it's been good to see, frankly. And uh, I think you'll see more. I think Ben Sass said that uh, that um, um, Lamar Alexander spoke for a lot of us. Mm. And you'll see more over the coming days. You'll see it in the closing statements that people make um, when members are allowed to speak tomorrow. Uh, Senator Rob Portman, someone in that right. camp as well. Why do you see that those, and, and how will they express it? They'll do it in these speeches. And why yes. do you think they feel that that's necessary to do it? Well, I think that they realize that their constituents know that something was wrong. Like I said, to argue, uh, as House Republicans did, that nothing was wrong just is so divorced from reality that it's not credible. And so uh, I think they're anxious to, to register some kind of disapproval, but still hope that's not enough to get the president upset with them. Mm -hmm. And if enough of them do it, then it will achieve that. And, and so th that's a good thing. And uh, it's been long in coming. I would have liked to have seen it before. There was a brief period exactly a week ago, last Monday morning, when it looked like there would be enough uh, to call for witnesses. But that briefly, uh, you know, it, it went. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I don't think that uh, that was a real concern beyond Wednesday of last week. Yes. 
Now we have Chaplain Barry Black uh, leading the prayer there. And he's um, mentioning that they're beginning the final arguments. Want to bring in Jonathan Turley, who in addition to being a witness in the House impeachment inquiry, not only is our legal analyst, but is a prolific writer of columns, <laughs> uh, of which my mother-in-law sent me your uh, column, of course, just out uh, this week. God bless her. Yes, just out this weekend. But you made the case in this column, and you've been saying it here, and lay out how you say that the House lost, essentially, this impeachment battle. Well, I think there were two colossal blunders on both sides. I think that the White House blundered by making the Dershowitz theory the center of their case, which I think backfired. But I think the bigger blunder was with the House. They rushed this vote. They insisted on impeaching by Christmas. And what I said in the testimony was just wait two months. You can get some of these witnesses. You can get additional court orders. It can only be stronger. The only thing we knew is if they rushed the vote by Christmas, they would lose. Because this is an incomplete case. And they could not have made it easier on the White House. And I think history will not look kindly on that decision. I think people will be baffled why they decided to do this, because they waited a month without doing anything after they approved the article. Because as you point out, in the impeachment case of President Nixon, it only took a few months to go all the way to That's the Supreme right. Court. Yeah. I want to bring in uh, Weijia Zhang at the White House, because Weijia, we started uh, this hour noting what an incredible week this is going to be, as the president is delivering his third State of the Union on right. Wednesday night. And it'll be only the second time in history that an impeached president will deliver a State of the Union. Um, Weijia, it's a the difficult time for them. Today. Well, senior administration officials are being Deputy really tight-lipped about whether the president will even mention his impeachment trial because he wants to deliver an optimistic message to try to bring the country together. But we know he tends to go off script. We know that he is angry. Just last night, he said his family has suffered because of this process. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he mentioned it because it certainly is on his mind. And remember, he's delivering the speech in the very place where his trial will still be going on. All right, Weijia, thank you. Let's listen in now to the Senate Majority Leader. By the two sides. We'll take a 30-minute lunch break after the House has made its initial presentation. Then we'll come back and finish this afternoon. Pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 488, the Senate has provided for up to four hours of closing arguments equally divided between the managers on the part of the House of Representatives and counsel and the counsel for the president. Pursuant to rule 22 of the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials, the argument shall be opened and closed on the part of the House of Representatives. The presiding officer recognizes Mr. Manager Schiff to begin the presentation on the part of the House of Representatives. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the U.S. Senate, counsel for the President. Almost 170 years ago, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts took to the well of the old Senate chamber, not, not far that. from where I'm standing. He delivered what would become perhaps his most famous address, the 7th of March speech. Webster sought to rally his colleagues to adopt the Compromise of 1850, a package of legislation that he and others hoped would forestall a civil war brewing over the question of slavery. He said, It is fortunate that there is a Senate of the United States, a body not yet moved from its propriety, not lost to a just sense of its own dignity and its own high responsibilities, and a body to which the country looks with confidence for wise, moderate, patriotic, and healing counsels. It is not to be denied that we live in the midst of strong agitations and are surrounded by very considerable dangers to our institutions of government. The imprisoned winds are let loose, but I have a duty to perform, and I mean to perform it with fidelity, not without a sense of surrounding dangers, but not without hope. Webster was wrong to believe that the Compromise of 1850 could prevent succession of the South, but I hope he was not wrong to put his faith in the Senate. Because the design of the Constitution and the intention of the framers was that the Senate would be a chamber removed from the sway of temporary political winds. In Federalist 65, Hamilton wrote, quote, Where else than in the Senate could have been found a tribunal sufficiently dignified or sufficiently independent? 
What other body would be likely to feel confidence enough in its own situation to preserve, unawed and uninfluenced, the necessary impartiality between an individual accused and the representatives of the people, his accusers? In the same essay, Hamilton explained this about impeachment. The subjects of its jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. They are of a nature which may, with peculiar, peculiar propriety, be dominated political, as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. The prosecution of them, for this reason, will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community, and to divide it into parties more or less friendly or inimical to the accused. In such cases, there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. Daniel Webster and Alexander Hamilton placed their hopes in you, the Senate, to be the court of greatest impartiality, to be a neutral representative of the people in determining, uninfluenced by party or pre-existing faction, the innocence or guilt of the President of the United States. Today you have a duty to perform, with fidelity, not without a sense of surrounding dangers, but also not without hope. I submit to you on behalf of the House of Representatives that your duty demands that you convict President Trump. Now, I don't pretend that this is an easy process. It's not designed to be easy. It shouldn't be easy to impeach or convict a president. Impeachment is an extraordinary remedy, a tool only to be used in rare instances of grave misconduct. But it is in the Constitution for a reason. In America, no one is above the law, even those elected President of the United States. And I would say, especially those elected President of the United States. You've heard arguments from the President's counsel that impeachment would overturn the results of the 2016 election. You have heard that in seeking the removal and disqualification of the President, the House is seeking to interfere in the next election. Senators, neither is true. And these arguments demonstrate a deeply misguided or, I think, intentional effort to mislead about the role that impeachment plays in our democracy. If you believe, as we do and as we have proven, that the President's efforts to use his official powers to cheat in the 2020 election jeopardize our national security and are antithetical to our democratic tradition, then you must come to no other conclusion that the President threatens the fairness of the next election and risk putting foreign interference between the voters and their ballots. Professor Dershowitz and the other counselors to the President have argued that if the President thinks that something is in his interest, then it is by definition in the interest of the American people. We have said throughout this process that we cannot and should not leave our common sense at the door. The logical conclusion this argument is, is that the President is the state, that his interests are the nation's interests, that his will is necessarily ours. You and I and the American people know otherwise. And we do not have to be constitutional scholars to understand that this is a position deeply at odds with our Constitution and our democracy. That believing in this argument or allowing the President to get away with misconduct based on this extreme, extreme view would render him above the law. But we know that this cannot be true. What you decide on these articles will have lasting implications for the future of the presidency, not only for this president, but for all future presidents. Whether or not the office of the presidency of the United States of America is above the law, that is the question. As Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in his 1835 work, Democracy in America, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being made more enlightened than any other nation but rather in her ability to repair her faults. In May of 1974, Barry Goldwater and other Republican congressional leaders went to the White House to tell President Nixon that it was time for him to resign and that they could no longer hold back the tide of impeachment over Watergate. Now, contrary to popular belief, the Republican Party did not abandon Nixon 
as the Watergate scandal came to light. It took years of disclosures and crisis and court battles. The party stood with Nixon through Watergate because he was a popular conservative president and his base was with him. So they were too. But ultimately, as Goldwater would tell Nixon, quote, there are only so many lies you can take and now there have been one too many. The president would have us believe that he did not withhold aid to course these sham investigations. That his July 25th call with the Ukrainians was perfect. That his meeting with President Zelensky on the sidelines of the UN is no different than a head of state meeting in the Oval Office. That his only interest in having Ukraine announce investigations into the Bidens was an altruistic concern over corruption. That the Ukrainians interfered in our 2016 election, not Russia. That Putin knows better than our own intelligence agencies. How many falsehoods can we take? When will it be one too many? Let us take a few minutes to remind you one last time of the facts of the president's misconduct as you consider how you'll vote on this important matter for our nation. Those facts compel the president's conviction on the two articles of impeachment. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, over the past two weeks, the House has presented to you overwhelming and unconverted evidence that President Trump has committed grave abuses of power that harmed our national security and were intended to defraud our elections. President Trump abused the extraordinary powers he alone holds as President of the United States to coerce an ally to interfere in our upcoming presidential election for the benefit of his own re-election. He then used those unique powers to wage an unprecedented campaign to obstruct Congress and cover up his wrongdoing. As the president's scheme to corrupt our election progressed over several months, it became, as one witness described, more insidious. The president and his agents wielded the powers of the presidency and the full weight of the U.S. government to increase pressure on Ukraine's new president to coerce him to announce two sham investigations that would smear his potential election opponent and raise his political standing. By early September of last year, the president's pressure campaign appeared on the verge of succeeding until that is the president got caught and the scheme was exposed. In response, President Trump ordered a massive cover-up, unprecedented in American history. He tried to conceal the facts from Congress, using every tool and legal window dressing he could to block evidence and muzzle witnesses. He tried to prevent the public from learning how he placed himself above country. And yet, even as President Trump has orchestrated this cover-up and obstructed Congress's impeachment inquiry, he remains unapologetic, unrestrained, and intent on continuing his sham to defraud our elections. As I stand here today, delivering the House's closing argument, President Trump's constitutional crimes his crimes against the American people and the nation remain in progress. As you make your final determination on the president's guilt, it is therefore worth revisiting the tot totality of the president's misconduct. Doing so lays bare the ongoing threat President Trump poses to our democratic system of government both to our upcoming election that some suggest should be the arbiter of the president's misconduct and to the Constitution itself that we all swore to support and defend. Donald Trump was the central player in the corrupt scheme assisted principally by his private attorney, Rudy Giuliani. Early in 2019, Giuliani conspired with two corrupt 
former Ukrainian prosecutors to fabricate and promote phony investigations of wrongdoing by former Vice President Joe Biden, as well as the Russian propaganda that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that hacked the DNC in 2016. In the course of their presentation to you, the President's counsel have made several remarkable admissions that affirm core elements of this scheme, including specifically about Giuliani's role and representation of the President. The President's counsel has conceded that Giuliani sought to convince Ukraine to investigate the Bidens and alleged Ukraine election interference on behalf of his client, the President, and that the President's focus on these sham investigations was significantly informed by Giuliani, whose views the President adopted. Compounding this damning admission, the President's counsel has also conceded that Giuliani was not conducting foreign policy on behalf of the President. They have confirmed that in pursuit, pursuing these two investigations, Giuliani was working solely in the President's private personal interest. And the President's personal interest is now clear to cheat in the next election. As Giuliani would later admit for the president's scheme to succeed, he first needed to remove the American ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, an anti-corruption champion Giuliani viewed as an obstacle who, and I quote, was, getting, was going to make the investigations difficult for everybody. Working with now indicted associates, Lev Parnas, and Igor Fruman, Giuliana orchestrated a bogus months-long smear campaign against the ambassador that culminated in her removal in April. The president's sudden order to remove our ambassador came just three days after Ukraine's presidential election in late April, which saw a reformer Vladimir Zelensky swept into office on an anti-corruption platform. President Trump called to congratulate Zelensky right after his victory. He invited President Zelensky to the White House and agreed to send Vice President Pence to his inauguration. But three weeks later, after Rudy Giuliani was denied a meeting with President Zelensky, President Trump abruptly, abruptly ordered Vice President Pence to cancel his trip. Instead, a lower-level delegation led by three of President Trump's political appointees, Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland, and Special Representative for Ukraine Negotiations Kurt Volker, attended Zelensky's inauguration the following week. These three returned from Ukraine impressed with President Zelensky. In a meeting shortly thereafter with President Trump in the Oval Office, they relayed their positive impression of the new Ukrainian president and encouraged President Trump to schedule the White House meeting he promised in his first call. But President Trump reacted negatively. He railed that Ukraine tried to take me down in 2016. And in order to schedule a White House visit for President Zelensky, President Trump told the delegation that they would have to, and I quote, talk to Rudy. It is worth pausing here to consider the importance of this meeting in late May. This is the moment that President Trump successfully hijacked the tools of our government to serve his corrupt personal interests. When the president's domestic political errand, as one witness famously described it, began to overtake and subordinate U.S. foreign policy and national security interests. By this point in the scheme, Rudy Giuliani was advocating very publicly for Ukraine to pursue the two sham investigations. But his request to meet with President Zelensky was rebuffed by the new Ukrainian president. According to reports about Ambassador Bolton's account, soon to be available, if not to this body, then to bookstores near you, 
The president also unsuccessfully tried to get Bolton to call the new Ukrainian president to ensure he would meet with Giuliani. The desire for Ukraine to announce these phony investigations was for a clear and corrupt reason, because President Trump wanted to politically benefit wanted the political benefit of a foreign country announcing that it would investigate his rival. Th that is how we know, without a doubt, that the object of the president's scheme was to benefit his re-election campaign. In other words, to cheat in the next election. Ukraine resisted announcing the investigations throughout June, so the president and his agent, Rudy Giuliani, turned up the pressure, this time by yielding the power of the United States government. In mid-June, the Department of Defense publicly announced that it would be releasing $250 million of military assistance to Ukraine. Almost immediately after seeing this, the president quietly ordered a freeze on the assistance to Ukraine. None of the 17 witnesses in our investigation were provided with a credible reason for the whole when it was implemented. All relevant agencies opposed the freeze. In July, Giuliani and the president's opponents, appointees made clear to Ukraine that a meeting at the White House would only be scheduled if Ukraine announced the sham investigations. According to a July 19 email, the White House has tried to suppress this drug deal, as Ambassador Bolton called it, was well known among the president's most senior officials, including his chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, and Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. And it was relayed directly to senior Ukrainian officials by Gordon Sondland on July 10 at the White House. Everyone was in the loop. Although President Zelensky explained that he did not want to be a pawn in Washington politics, President Trump did not care. In fact, on July 25, before President Trump spoke to President Zelensky, President Trump personally conveyed the terms of this quid pro quo to Gordon Sondland, who then relayed the message to Ukraine's president. Later that morning, during the now infamous phone call, President Trump explicitly requested that Ukraine investigate the Bidens and the 2016 election. Zelensky responded as President Trump instructed. He assured President Trump that he would undertake these investigations. After hearing this commitment, President Trump reiterated his invitation to the White House at the end of the call. Now, no later than a few days after the call, the highest levels of the Ukrainian government learned about the hold on military assistance. Senior Ukrainian officials decided to keep it quiet, recognizing the harm it would cause to Ukraine's defense, to the new government standing at home, and to its negotiating posture with Russia. Officials in Ukraine and the United States hoped that the hold would be reversed before it became public. As we now know, that was not to be. As we have explained during the trial, the president's scheme did not begin with the July 25th call, and it did not end there either. As instructed, a top aide to President Zelensky met with Giuliani in early August, and they began working on a press statement for Zelensky to issue that would announce the two sham investigations and lead to a White House meeting. Now, let's be very clear here. The documentary evidence alone, the text messages, the emails that we've showed you, confirms definitely the president's corrupt, uh, definitively, the president's corrupt quid pro quo for the White House meeting. Subsequent testimony further affirms that the president withheld this official act, this highly coveted Oval Office meeting, to apply pressure on Ukraine to do his personal bidding. The evidence is unequivocal. 
Despite this pressure, by mid-August, President Zelensky resisted such an explicit announcement of the two politically motivated investigations desired by President Trump. As a result, the White House meeting remained unscheduled, just as it remains unscheduled to this day. During this same time frame in August, the President persisted in maintaining the hold on the aid, despite warnings that he was breaking the law by doing so, as an independent watchdog recently confirmed that he did. According to the evidence presented to you, the president's entire cabinet believed he should release the aid because it was in the national security interest of our country. During the entire month of August, there was no internal review of the aid. Congress was not notified, nor was there any credible reason provided within the executive branch. With no explanation offered, and with the explicit, clear, yet unsuccessful quid pro quo for the White House meeting in the front of his mind, Ambassador Sondland testified that the only logical conclusion was that the President was also withholding military assistance to increase the pressure on Ukraine to announce the investigations. As Sondland and another witness testified, this conclusion was as simple as two plus two equals four. If the White House meeting wasn't sufficient leverage to extract the announcements he wanted, Trump would use the frozen aid as his hammer. Secretary Pompeo confirmed Sondland's conclusion in an August 22 email. It was also clear that Vice President Pence was aware of the quid pro quo over the aid and was directly informed of such in Warsaw on September 1, after the freeze had become public and Ukraine became desperate. Sondland pulled aside a top aide in Warsaw and told him that everything, both the White House meeting and also the security assistant, were conditioned on the announcement of the investigations that Sondland, Giuliani, and others had been negotiating with the same aid earlier in August. This is an important point. The President claims that Ukraine did not know of the freeze in aid, though we know this to be false. As the former Deputy Foreign Minister has admitted publicly, they found out about it within days of the July 25th call and kept it quiet. But no one can dispute that even after the whole became public on, July, on August 28th, President Trump's representatives continued their efforts to secure Ukraine's announcement of the investigations. This is enough to prove extortion in court. And it is certainly enough to prove it here. If that wasn't enough, however, on September 7, more than a week after the aid freeze became public, President Trump confirmed directly to Sondland that he wanted President Zelensky in a public box and that his release of the aid was conditioned on the announcement of the two sham investigations. Having received direct confirmation from President Trump, Sondland relayed the President's message to President Zelensky himself. President Zelensky could resist no longer. America's military assistant makes up 10 percent of his country's defense budget, and President Trump's visible lack of support for Ukraine harmed his leverage in negotiations with Russia. President Zelensky affirmed to Sondland on that same telephone call that he would announce the investigations in an interview on CNN. President Trump's pressure campaign appeared to have succeeded. Two days after President Zelensky confirmed his intention to meet President Trump's demands, the House of Representatives announced its investigation into these very issues. 
Shortly thereafter, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community notified the intelligence communities that the whistleblower complaint was being improperly handled or with improperly withheld from Congress with the White House knowledge. In other words, the president got caught. And two days later, on September 11, the president released the aid. To this day, however, Ukraine still has not received all of the money Congress has appropriated and the White House meeting has yet to be scheduled. The identity of the whistleblower, moreover, is irrelevant. The House did not rely on the whistleblower's complaint, even as it turned out to be remarkably accurate. It does not matter who initially sounded the alarm when they saw smoke. What matters is that the firefighters, Congress, were summoned and found the blaze. And we know that we did. The facts about the president's misconduct are not seriously in dispute as several Republican senators have acknowledged publicly. We have proved that the president abused his power in precisely the manner charged in Article I. President Trump withheld a White House meeting an essential congressionally appropriated military assistance from Ukraine in order to pressure Ukraine to interfere in the upcoming presidential election on his behalf. The sham investigations President Trump wanted announced had no legitimate purpose and were not in the national interest. Despite the President's counsel's troubling reliance on conspiracy theories to claim the President acted in the public interest. The President was not focused on fighting corruption. In fact, he was trying to pressure Ukraine's president to act corruptly by announcing these baseless investigations. And the evidence makes clear that the president's decision to withhold Ukraine's military aid is not connected in any way to purported concerns about corruption or burden and daring. Rather, the evidence was presented to you, that was presented to you is damning, chilling, disturbing, and disgraceful. President Trump weaponized our government and the vast powers entrusted to him by the American people and the Constitution to target his political rival and corrupt our precious elections subverted our national security and our democracy in the process. He put his personal interests over those of the country, and he violated his oath of office in the process. But the president's grave abuse of power did not end there. In conduct unparalleled in American history, once he got caught, President Trump engaged in categorical and indiscriminate obstruction of any investigation into his wrongdoing. He ordered every government agency and every official to defy the House's impeachment inquiry. And he did so for a simple reason, to conceal evidence of his wrongdoing from Congress and the American people. The president's obstruction was unlawful and unprecedented, but it also confirmed his guilt. Innocent people don't try to hide every document and witness, especially those that would clear them. That's what guilty people do. That's what guilty people do. Innocent people do everything they can to clear their name and provide evidence that shows that they are innocent. 
But it would be a mistake to view the president's obstruction narrowly, as the president's counsel have tried to portray it. The president did not defy the House's impeachment inquiry as part of a routine inner branch dispute or because he wanted to protect the constitutional rights and privileges of his presidency. He did it consistent with his vow to fight all subpoenas. The second article of impeachment goes to the heart of our Constitution and our democratic system of government. The framers of the Constitution purposefully entrusted the power of impeachment in the legislative branch so that it may protect the American people from a corrupt president. The president was able to undertake such comprehensive obstruction only because of the exceptional powers entrusted to him by the American people. And he wielded that power to make sure Congress would not receive a single record or a single document related to his conduct and to bar his closest aides from testifying about his scheme. Throughout the House's inquiry, just as they did during the trial, the President's counsel offered bad faith and meritless legal arguments as transparent legal window dressing intended to legitimize and justify the President's efforts to hide evidence of his misconduct. We've explained why all of these legal excuses hold no merit, why the House's subpoenas were valid, how the House's, House appropriately exercised its impeachment authority, how the President's strategy was to stall and obstruct. We've explained how the President, after the fact, reliance on unfounded and in some cases, brand new legal privileges are shockingly transparent cover for a president dictate a blanket obstruction. We've underscored how the president's defiance of Congress is unprecedented in the history of our republic. And we all know that an innocent person would eagerly provide testimony and documents to clear his name, as the president apparently thought he was doing mistakenly when he released the call records of his two telephone calls with President Zelensky. And even as the president has claimed to be protecting the presidency, remember that the president never actually invoked executive privilege throughout this entire inquiry, a revealing fact given the law's prohibition on invoking executive privilege to shield wrongdoing. And yet, according to the President's counsel, the President is justified in resisting the House's impeachment inquiry. They assert that the House should have taken the President to court to defy the obstruction. The President's argument is as shameless as it is hypocritical. The President's counsel is arguing in this trial that the House should have gone to court to enforce its subpoenas, while at the same time, the President's own Department of Justice is arguing in court that the House could not enforce the subpoenas through the courts. And you know what remedy they say in court is available to the House? Impeachment for obstruction of Congress. This is not the first time this argument has been made. President Nixon made it too, but it was roundly rejected by the House Judiciary Committee 45 years ago. When the committee passed an article for obstruction of Congress for far less serious obstruction than we have here. The committee concluded that it was inappropriate to enforce its subpoenas in court. And as the slide shows, the committee concluded that it was inappropriate to seek the aid of the courts to enforce its subpoenas against the president. 
This conclusion is based on the constitutional provision vesting the power of impeachment solely in the House of Representatives and the express denial by the framers of the Constitution of any role for the courts in the impeachment process. Again, the committee report on Nixon's articles of impeachment. Once we strip the president's obstruction of this legal window dressing, the consequences are as clear as they are dire for our democracy. To condone the president's obstruction would strike a death blow to the impeachment clause in the Constitution. And if Congress cannot enforce this sole power vested in both chambers alone, the Constitution's final line of defense against a corrupt presidency will be eviscerated. A president who can obstruct and thwart the impeachment power becomes unaccountable. He or she is effectively above the law. And such a president is more likely to engage in corruption with impunity. This will become the new normal with this president and for future generations. So where does this leave us? As many of you in this chamber have publicly acknowledged in the past few days, the facts are not seriously in dispute. We have proved that the president committed grave offenses against the Constitution. The question that remains is whether that conduct warrants conviction and removal from office. Should the Senate simply accept or even condone such corrupt conduct by a president? Absent conviction and removal, how can we be assured that this president will not do it again? If we are to rely on the next election to judge the president's efforts to cheat in that election, how can we know that the election will be free and fair? How can we know that every vote will be free from foreign interference solicited by the president himself? With President Trump, the past is prologue. This is neither the first time that the president solicited foreign interference in his own election, nor is it the first time that the president tried to obstruct an investigation into his misconduct. But you will determine, you will determine, you will determine whether it will be his last. As we speak, the president continues his wrongdoing unchecked and unashamed. Donald Trump hasn't stopped trying to pressure Ukraine to smear his opponent, nor has he stopped obstructing Congress. His political agent, Rudolf Giuliani recently returned to the scene of the crime in Ukraine to manufacture more dirt for his client, the President of the United States. President Trump remains a clear and present danger to our national security and to our credibility around the world. He is decimating our global standing as a beacon of democracy while corrupting our free and fair elections here at home. What is a greater protection to our country than ensuring that we, the American people, alone, not some foreign power, choose our commander in chief? The American people alone should decide who represents us in any office without foreign interference, particularly the highest office in the land. And what could undermine our national security more than to withhold from a foreign ally fighting a hot war against our adversary? Hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid 
to buy sniper rifles, rocket-propelled grenade launchers, radar and night vision goggles, so that they may fight the war over there, keeping us safe here. If we allow the president's misconduct to stand, what message do we send? What message do we send to Russia, our adversary, intent on fracturing democracy around the world? What will we say to our European allies already concerned with this president about whether the United States will continue to support our NATO commitments that have been a pillar of our foreign policy since World War II? What message do we send to our allies in the free world? And if we allow the president's misconduct to stand, what will we say to the 68,000 men and women in uniform in Europe right now who courageously and admirably wake up every day ready and willing to fight for America's security and prosperity, for democracy in Europe and around the world? What message do we send them when we say America's national security is for sale? That cannot be the message we want to send to our Ukrainian friends or our European allies or to our children and our grandchildren who will inherit this precious republic. And I'm sure it is not the message that you wish to send to our adversaries. The late Senator John McCain was an astounding man, a man of great principle, a great patriot. He fought admirably in Vietnam and was imprisoned as a POW for over five years, refusing an offer by the North Vietnamese to be released early because his father was a prominent admiral. As you all are aware, Senator McCain was a great supporter of Ukraine, a great supporter of Europe, a great supporter of our troops. Senator McCain understood the importance of this body, this distinguished body, and serving the public, once saying, quote, Glory belongs to the act of being constant to something greater than yourself, to a cause, to your principles, to the people on whom you rely and who rely on you. The Ukrainians and the Europeans and the Americans around the world and here at home are watching what we do. They are watching to see what the Senate will do. And they are relying on this distinguished body to be constant to the principles America was founded on and which we've tried to uphold for more than 240 years. Doing the right thing and being constant to our principles requires a level of moral courage that is difficult, but by no means impossible. It is that moral courage shown by public servants throughout this country and throughout the impeachment inquiry in the House. People like Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, her decades of nonpartisan service were turned against her in a vicious smear campaign that reached all the way to the president. Despite this effort, she decided to honor a duly authorized congressional subpoena and to speak the truth to the American people. For this, she was the subject of yet more smears against her career and her character, even as she testified in a public hearing before Congress 
Her courage mattered. People like Ambassador Bill Taylor, a West Point graduate who wears a bronze star and an air medal for valor, and his proudest honor, a combat infantryman's badge. When his country called on him, he answered again and again and again in battle, in foreign affairs, and in the face of a corrupt effort by the president to extort a foreign country into helping his reelection campaign, an effort that Ambassador Taylor rightly believed was crazy. His courage mattered. People like Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who came to this country as a young child, fleeing authoritarianism in Europe. He could have done anything with his life, but he true chose public service, putting on a uniform and receiving a Purple Heart after being wounded in battle, fighting courageously in Iraq. When he heard that fateful July 25th call in which the president sold out our country for his own personal gain, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman reported it and later came before Congress to speak the truth about what happened. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's courage mattered. To the other public servants who came forward and told the truth in the face of vicious smears, intimidation, and White House efforts to silence you, your courage mattered. You did the right thing. You did your duty. No matter what happens today or from this day forward, that courage mattered. Whatever the outcome in this trial, we will remain vigilant in the House. I know there are dedicated public servants who know the difference between right and wrong. But make no mistake, these are perilous times. If we determine that the remedy for a president who cheats in an election is to pronounce him vindicated and attack those who exposed his misconduct. Senators, uh, before we break, I want to take a moment to say something about the staff who have worked tirelessly on the impeachment inquiry and this trial for months now. There is a small army of public servants down the hall from this chamber, in offices throughout the House, and yes, in that windowless bunker in the Capitol, who have committed their lives to this effort because they, like the managers and the American people, believe that a president free of accountability is a danger to the beating heart of our democracy. I'm grateful to all of them, but let me mention a few. Daniel Goldman, Maher Batar, Rian Workla, Patrick Boland, William Evans, Patrick Fallon, Sean Misko, Nicholas Mitchell, Daniel Noble, Deanna Pilipenko, Emily Simons, Suzanne Grooms, Krista Boyd, Norm Eisen, Barry Burke, Joshua Matz, Doug Letter, Sarah Istel, Ashley Etienne, Terry McCullough, Dick Meltzer, and Wendy Parker. Some of those staff, including some singled out in this chamber, have been made to endure the most vicious false attacks to the point where they feel their lives have been put at risk. The attacks on them degrade our institution and all who serve in it. You have asked me why I hired certain of my staff, and I will tell you, because they're brilliant, hardworking, patriotic, and the best people for the job. And they deserve better than the attacks they have been forced to suffer. Members of the Senate, Mr. Chief Justice, I want to close this portion of our statement by reading you the words of our dear friend and former colleague in the House, the late Elijah Cummings who said this on the day that the Speaker announced the beginning of the impeachment inquiry. 
As elected representatives, he said, of the American people, we speak not only for those who are here with us now, but for generations yet unborn. Our voices today are messages to a future we may never see. When the history books are written about this tumultuous era, I want them to show that I was among those in the House of Representatives who stood up to lawlessness and tyranny. We, the managers, are not here representing ourselves alone or even just the House. Just as you are not here making a determination as the President's guilt or innocence for yourselves alone. Now, you and we represent the American people, the ones at home and at work who are hoping that their country will remain what it has always believed it to be, a beacon of hope, of democracy, and of inspiration to those striving around the world to create their own more perfect unions, for those who are standing up to lawlessness and to tyranny. Donald Trump has betrayed his oath to protect and defend the Constitution, but it is not too late for us to honor ours, to wield our power to defend our democracy. As President Abraham Lincoln said at the close of his Cooper Union Address on February 27, 1860, neither let us be slandered by, from our duty by false accusations against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Today we urge you in the face of overwhelming evidence of the President's guilt and knowing that if left in office he will continue to seek foreign interference in the next election, to vote to convict on both articles of impeachment and to remove from office Donald J. Trump, the 45th President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice, we reserve the balance of our time. The majority, the majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, colleagues will take a 30-minute break for lunch. Without objection, so ordered. making their final closing arguments uh, in the impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. Uh, Ricky Kleeman is here with us, our CBS News legal analyst. You've been listening along to this, Ricky. Uh, it's, it's sort of interesting that at the very end, Adam Schiff sort of imploring and pointing out that this is how people vote and how they choose to decide uh, whether or not the president should be removed will be forever a part of their legacy and a part of the, of the way that they are perceived by the American people. Well, there's, there is no doubt. I think it's part of what we had discussed earlier this morning on the issue of why there are certain senators making public comments about uh, why they did not vote for witnesses or documents. And that's to really make an impression on their electorate. Um, that is their personal electorate, whatever state they're in. But what Adam Schiff does is he takes it and he broadens it because it's not only about their state and whether or not they will be reelected. It's also about the reputation of the Senate body, of how do we look at the Senate. Um, as it, it has been said that the Senate has looked down upon the House throughout uh, the time of our Republic mm -hmm. um, because the Senate is the august body and the Senate is the place where justice is done. And I think that uh, Adam Schiff, from his point of view, is, is well advised right. to make this argument. You, the Senate has often been called the world's greatest deliberative body, but can it be thus if they choose not to deliberate over the evidence or over the witnesses? Uh, I read um, an, a wonderful private piece that I hope will be published by an adjunct professor um, at Dartmouth who did a, um, a death notice. Uh, of the Senate uh, as the world's greatest deliberative, or the America's greatest deliberative body. And, and it, um, it struck me to my heart and my head 
uh, without, because I, I won't um, uh, become an advocate uh, in my role as a legal analyst here, I do think that objectively we can state that you cannot be a, the world's greatest or the America's greatest deliberative body if you do not deliberate on evidence because you do not have the evidence before you because you have chosen not to see it, read it, or hear it. And to Speaker, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's point, uh, she made the point before the Senate trial began that the president okay. could forever be impeached. Perfect. Now she is saying, and others are saying, that the president isn't really truly exonerated. Well, what do you think legally that means? Um, what they're really trying to say is, well, clearly the president is, is not exonerated. Even if he's found... Because exonerated is not the same thing as being acquitted. Um, in, in the world of the law, as opposed to politics, in the world of the law, if we were in a court of law rather than an impeachment trial, if you are found not guilty, it does not mean that you are innocent. It means that you have not been proven guilty. Mm. So someone could think you might have done it, you, they believe that you did it, but it wasn't proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, that's the standard in a criminal trial. So the burden of proof is on the government. Here we're in a political trial, a political forum, but nevertheless, the House managers have the ability to argue, and certainly Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House uh, and uh, the leading Democrat in the House has the ability um, to argue forcefully that there is no exoneration here, because how can you exonerate someone when you have refused to hear evidence or review documents. Um, the, it, it, it was, or it could be argued on the other side, because I should be arguing both sides, mm -hmm. can be argued on the other side that the House record was accepted by the Senate as part of their evidence. And um, so there is evidence before the Senate. But when you have the drip, drip, drip of John Bolton's book coming out, and John Bolton was clearly in the room where it happened, and you have Pat Cipollone, who is arguing uh, as the White House lawyer, the one would say he was arguing as the president's lawyer, and he was also, according to John Bolton's book, uh, at at least one meeting in the room where it happened. Mm. Uh, you have more issues about was this proceeding uh, in the Senate appropriate? Can someone have that blatant a conflict of interest when you are a material witness to a conversation in the room where it happened and still be an advocate? Uh, certainly in a court of law, you could not. Mm. Certainly if someone wanted to make a referral to the Bar Association about this conflict of interest for them to look at the ethical conduct of Mr. Cipollone, they could make that referral. I don't think it's going to arrive in the Bar Council's office by magic. So <clears throat> to the point of the uh, lack of, or the, in fact, we had no witnesses um, in the Senate impeachment trial, here's what the president just tweeted. Uh, quote, where is the whistleblower? Where is the second whistleblower? Where is the informer? Why did corrupt politician Schiff make up my conversation with the Ukrainian president? Why didn't the House do, a job, do its job? And so, S-O-O-O-O, much more. Um, when the president says, where's the whistleblower, where's the second whistleblower, sounds like he wanted, he wanted witnesses to be produced. Well, one of the arguments that I thought was really well taken um, by the House managers was when witnesses would be produced, they are everyone's witnesses, everyone's. So it's not like John Bolton becomes the witnesses brought forth in the Senate by the House managers. It's their everyone's witnesses. So if they all wanted to put together a list of witnesses and call them in, they are there to il uh, illuminate the truth. Now, the whistleblower. Let's be serious about this. There are protections in the law for whistleblowers, and for good reason, because people would be fearful of blowing the whistle because of retaliation in their jobs. This permeates, not only are we dealing with issues of the 
uh, the president, the Congress, the judiciary. We're dealing with issues that go down into the private sector, into big business, small business, any business, where you not only a business, you could be in the in the school system, you could be in the health and hospital system, whatever you would like to call it that we protect whistleblowers. We do not give up their identity. I, it's, it's just part of the fabric of the law. And, and in fact, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, when he was handed a question by Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, which uh, apparently named the whistleblower, he chose not to read it. Of course. Um, and and uh, that was an interesting moment for sure. And I wonder, it makes me wonder then, um, in a way, by not allowing witnesses to be called, Perhaps Senate Republicans realize that if they did allow, uh, I think a lot of the discussion has been around John Bolton and perhaps Mick Mulvaney making an appearance on the Hill, but they would have also faced a situation where the president would demand for the whistleblower to be called and they would have, given their behavior, in other words, the Republicans uh, seem to do essentially what President Trump's bidding, whatever his bidding is, they would be, find themselves in a situation where they might have to actually out this whistleblower on the floor of the United States Senate. Well, I have to believe this. Um, in my heart of hearts, not my head of heads necessarily, but my heart of hearts. John Roberts, who is the presiding officer here, who does not, uh, because uh, certainly when we go back to um, the Clinton impeachment, Justice Rehnquist, also the Chief Justice, had decided that being, being the presiding officer means you do not take quote unquote an active role, mm -hmm. but you're there to simply preside. I have to believe in my heart of hearts that if the uh, Republicans decided that they were going to out the whistleblower, that he would not permit that. Mm. Um, Ricky, stand by. I want to bring in uh, White House uh, uh, producer and reporter Catherine Watson. Uh, she is uh, joining us now from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so, Catherine, uh, to the point that I was just making there to Ricky, uh, the president's tweets, where's the whistleblower, where's the second whistleblower, also the president in the midst of the closing arguments from the House manager uh, tweeting, keep America great, make America great again. Uh, what are you hearing about the White House in terms of how they are feeling going forward, even though we understand that the president wanted this to be wrapped up before the State of the Union now looks like it's going to be wrapped up on Wednesday. To Ricky's point, even if he is not removed, uh, he does not change the fact that he is still not exonerated. But the president may go with that, that assumption. Sure. Well, the president is going to use the lines that he wants to use uh, no matter what his legal team may say. Obviously, the president's legal team is ready for this to all be over, as we expect it to be on Wednesday. Uh, as my colleagues and I have reported, the White House legal t the White House is incredibly confident that the president is going to be acquitted. It's just a numbers game, right? The math just simply is not there uh, for the president to be convicted. So there is a full expectation expectation that he will be acquitted Wednesday afternoon, which of course will come right after his State of the Union address. But like you said, the president continues to take to Twitter. It's the platform where he can speak most directly to his supporters. Uh, just maybe 20, 30 minutes ago, he tweeted about how this is all a hoax, impeachment is a hoax. Uh, he tweeted about how he says there was no pressure uh, on the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians said that there was no pressure, at least publicly. So he's using a lot of the lines that he's used all along, and we can expect to see him continue to use Twitter. He has no public events today. He's just having lunch with the vice president. At least that's the only thing on his public schedule. Of course, he makes calls to allies and does other things throughout the day, but we don't expect to hear from him any other way other than Twitter today. Uh, and we should point out that we're seeing some uh, senators there speaking before the camera, including uh, Senator Lankford of Oklahoma. Uh, if we uh, find, uh, I don't know if we have the sound guys, if we want to uh, play that, because it doesn't look like it's a head-on shot. Um, all right, Catherine, let's, let's continue our discussion, Catherine. Uh, so, um, to your point, I wonder, Catherine, are you hearing at all from the White House, that the president, uh, given that he has no public events on his schedule today, uh, and given that there are some 
Republican senators who are coming out and saying, you know, about half a dozen, that the president's actions with regards to that phone call with Volodymyr Zelensky uh, was inappropriate. Um, you had Senator Alexander even suggesting that it may have crossed the line. It wasn't impeachable, but uh, certainly not appropriate to the point that you made about the president tweeting uh, that if you listen to the president and foreign minister of Ukraine, I'm, I'm quoting the president's tweets here, uh, they said, no pressure, nothing will ever satisfy the do-nothing radical left Dems. But there are some Republicans that are saying this was inappropriate. And so I wonder, uh, can we expect the president to lash out at folks like Mitt Romney? Or uh, are you hearing that he, they may say to him, uh, those uh, in the administration, look, uh, perhaps not the best look for you to attack uh, the members of the Senate who have chosen to acquit you and not remove you if they go out on the record and say they think that there was something inappropriate about pressuring a foreign leader to investigate your political opponent. Sure. Well, this is not something that pleases the president to have Republican senators going out and saying that he did anything wrong. The president continues to insist his call was perfect. Uh, many uh, legal experts have suggested all along that perhaps the best argument Republicans might have is to say, hey, this was wrong, it's inappropriate, it shouldn't happen again, uh, but maybe it doesn't rise to the level of impeachment. That's kind of what we're seeing some Republican senators saying now. So it really is. Uh, a game of waiting and seeing whether the president keeps those frustrations, uh, not necessarily just to himself, but whether he just vents with uh, allies privately, or whether he does, you know, take to Twitter or any other uh, form to criticize these senators. It also might be on an individual basis. Look, the president and Mitt Romney uh, obviously do not have a great relationship. Uh, they have not for uh, any time that the president has been in office. So so it may be on an individual basis that the president um, allows some of his frustration uh, to be vented, but we'll just see. At the end of the day, uh, we expect for the president to be acquitted. The White House certainly does. So we'll see if the president is able to keep those frustrations uh, private. And real quick before we let you go, Catherine, uh, what are you hearing about the upcoming State of the Union uh, address? Uh, do you uh, have anyone uh, from the administration saying to you that perhaps the president will mention? Because it will be really interesting. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, my historical uh, nerdy friends on Twitter can correct me, but I don't recall if uh, Andrew Johnson delivered a State of the Union when he was being impeached, but perhaps Bill Clinton did. Um, did he? Ricky Clement Bill is Clinton nodding. did, and Andrew Johnson did not. Okay, so there we go. So this would not be the first time. <laughs> time in history, but uh, I, I wonder what you're hearing about what the president may potentially uh, bring up in that State of the Union. Administration officials are being pretty tight-lipped on whether the president is going to address impeachment directly. Um, I think it's quite more likely that he alludes to impeachment. We'll see if that happens or not. We do know that he's supposed to deliver a speech uh, with a tone of optimism and hit on many of the themes that he so often does, the economy, trade, and trying to tout some of those accomplishments. He will be addressing immigration, a, a few more controversial issues. But it will be really interesting to see. Um, a spokesperson for Pelosi tells me that the president and Pelosi have not spoken at all since an October 2019 meeting that uh, really went off the rails pretty quickly, in which the president and Pelosi couldn't even really agree publicly on what insult the president um, gave towards the Speaker of the House. So, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting, fascinating time for the president to be there uh, a day before we expect this acquittal vote, but obviously looking out at a sea of enemies in his mind uh, and allies. So it'll be fascinating. Yes, it will. It will indeed be fascinating. We'll look forward to your reporting and uh, also your very, uh, very, very good uh, Twitter account, which actually does report uh, <laughs> nuggets. Um, I urge our viewers to follow you on Twitter because you do um, provide sometimes insights uh, uh, that um, th that people may not be familiar with, um, with regards to your reporting when you're there on the ground uh, at the White House. So we thank you for that, Catherine. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's continue on with Ricky. So, um, can, can I go back to yeah. the point? Because I, um, I think it's really important so that, uh, you know, Catherine and I, I think, are both very clear. President Trump on Wednesday will be acquitted. 
I mean, there is no debate about this. It's, it's like going to the movie when you know the ending. Um, it, it, that's what's going to happen mm -hmm. on Wednesday. However, that acquittal will be argued in completely different directions at the, each end of the spectrum, if you will, by both sides. President Trump will continue to say, see, I told you it was a witch hunt, it was a hoax, and he'll go after uh, Nancy Pelosi, Adam Schiff, and the House, uh, and, and that will be his position, and he will say he's fully exonerated, just as he did at the time of the Mueller report coming out. The Democrats, on the other hand, have every right to say that although he is acquitted, he was acquitted without evidence or documents that were available to the Senate at the time of the trial. And that in trials before, that is, the Johns, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton, there were numerous witnesses at trial. And so the Democrats have the ability to say, well, yes, he was acquitted, but he was not exonerated. Mm. And so the question, I guess, then, uh, and we talked about this earlier, is as new information comes out, do we expect that the Democratic controlled House will continue to have committee hearings as new information is made available, as we learn more, as we learn more from Ambassador Bolton's book? I, I would be stunned if they do not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that uh, when you have a dog in the race, uh, or a horse in the race, depending on what mm -hmm. uh, sport you are mm -hmm. in, that you can't quite let it go. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that um, uh, there were lots of tweets uh, in the Twitter sphere as of Friday of people saying, well, why don't the House managers just simply uh, go back to the House and, and go back into the Intelligence Committee or the Judiciary Committee and call John Bolton over the weekend? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that. You're in the middle of a trial and before the Senate, and you can't suddenly convene the House committee to, in essence, circumvent the Senate. I mean, could you do it? I guess you could do it, but should you do it? Absolutely not. But once this is over on Wednesday, I assume before 6 p.m., um, that because the vote is uh, go, the final vote will be at four o'clock, and it's a matter of simply calling the roll. And there was no way that they were ever uh, going to get the Democrats. That is, we're ever going to get to 67 votes. You need a two-thirds vote. Mm -hmm. Every vote on Friday was 51-49. Um, and so here, uh, will the House? you know, take a breath and then decide that they should go forward. It would be stunning to me if Adam Schiff uh, and Jerry Nadler decided that either Judiciary Committee or Intelligence Committee were not going to call John Bolton. And yet, uh, so there are two things bubbling, I guess, with uh, Bolton's book. One is the fact that the White House is perhaps seeking to block uh, uh, the book from even coming out. What a surprise. Uh, right. Uh, not at all surprising. On the other hand, um, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of wondering if because of the, the action that the Senate will take this week, that what difference does it make what comes out in Bolton's book? Clearly, the Senate is not interested in hearing any uh, new evidence. They're not interested in hearing any witness, any new witnesses. And even if they do, all of them or, or the majority of them are saying what the president did was not impeachable, was not wrong. So my question would be then what's the White House worried about? Let the stuff come out. I mean, the president has been so far well, he's pretty impenetrable. much. Exactly. Impenetrable. Exactly. Um, you, you, there are no guardrails here now. Uh, even John Kelly, uh, the former chief of staff for President Trump, became very vocal uh, through his own social media and otherwise to say that the Senate should hear witnesses and see documents. Yeah, he said it's, it's a half a trial if it doesn't Correct. include the witnesses. And, and, and I think that John Kelly did not have to do that. Mm -hmm. He did not have to come out of this quiet place wherever he is now and, and say that, but he did. And why? I say because he is a patriot. Um, and that he felt that if you're going to do it, you ought to do it fairly. I mean, my whole thing as a lawyer is let the chips fall where they may in any trial, whether it's a political trial like impeachment or it's, as is ongoing now, a criminal trial like Harvey Weinstein. 
But let the process be fair. And what the Democrats are saying, and the House managers in particular are saying, is it was not fair mm. to uh, have an impeachment trial if you do did not have witnesses or see documents that became available. And it's also why Mitch McConnell was very careful on Friday to make sure the record was closed so that any new bombshells that broke between Friday night and Wednesday at 4 wouldn't matter. Would, wouldn't matter. It, but it, it matters to the American people, I would think, well, or that's, some of them. And so I guess that's probably uh, sort of my final question, which is um, we always talk about in, with, within the law of precedence and what precedence means down the line. Um, and Anne-Marie and I were talking about this recently. What we're trying to figure out is if you have people, for example, like uh, one of the president's lawyers, Alan Dershowitz, saying that even if you don't like what the president did with regards to Vice President, former Vice President Biden, um, the idea of investigating your political opponent uh, because you want to win an election is in the public interest. If the president, the president's reelection, everything that he does to ensure his reelection can be considered in the public interest. It's ridiculous. Oh, so, but, but, the, so then we, Anne Marie and I were talking to each other and we were like, well, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean if a Democrat is elected president and asks a foreign country to investigate a Republican opponent, um, would it be true? Treated the same way by the courts, and somebody said to us, "Well, no, because if we remember that an impeachment proceeding and a, and a Senate trial is political and not legal in nature, then that circumstance of a Democrat doing the very same thing that this president will be acquitted for might be treated differently because it's a different person, it's a different administration, it's a different group of senators, perhaps." Or would the court say, no, 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 can't have it both ways. There is a precedent set here, and it was set on the floor of the United States Senate uh, when they voted to uh, acquit this president by saying that what he did was perhaps inappropriate but not impeachable. Can't have it this way if it's a Democrat that does the same thing. Well, I would think that that would be tragic, frankly. Um, I think that Mr. Dershowitz's position was so far out there that it was really shocking to, uh, to lawyers. Jonathan Turley, um, who spoke as the constitutional lawyer uh, f on behalf of the Republican side of this when he spoke in the Judiciary Committee before the House, Jonathan Turley, who was also a CBS News legal analyst based in Washington and a very, very bright constitutional law professor, he too has said that um, the adoption of, of the Dershowitz ar which argument proves too much. Mm. These are my words, that it proves too much, that it, it really was not the appropriate position to be taken, and that it really should have no precedential value. You have to remember that the senators who are voting both for, who have voted for no witness, further witnesses or documents, and who will vote ultimately for acquittal, are not necessarily endorsing the Dershowitz view. There were various points of view and various arguments raised by uh, the Republican defenders of the president. And the, what the vote of acquittal means does not necessarily mean that it adopts the Dershowitz view, which I think is so beyond the pale. I, I, I have often wondered, Alan Dershowitz is an old friend of mine mm -hmm. from our days of practicing law in Boston. Um, I, I've known him for decades. And I do not know what has happened to him mm. because he is a very, very good lawyer with a great legal mind and he did not have to go out on a limb to this level. I mean, there, no one else, by the way, yeah. argued that. But so, but so, given that there was, you know, again, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but so given that there was sort of no, there wasn't a ruling on his suggestion. In other words, you just listened to it, and he said it, and it ran as news by, as a soundbite on news uh, in news programs. But it doesn't really matter, other than the fact that he said it on the floor of the Senate. But some young legal student can't, you know, in arguing for sure. something that is inappropriate or illegal, say, well, uh, in in you know, in Trump v. the you know Democrats, uh, lawyer Alan Dershowitz said this, and a judge would say, oh, you're right, that was said on the floor of the Senate, so it must be true. Well, that would be a shame. <laughs> right, um, yeah. But the the reality of the situation is that there were much more sensible arguments raised by other 
uh, defenders of the president um, and raised in a way that were uh, far more legally sustainable than Mr. Dershowitz's position. But the reason your argument is scaring me in mm. my seat is the fact that throughout the history of law and cases, as we go back to look at precedent, often what is called dicta, not the holding of the case, but other language of a case or language of an argument, sometimes dicta in a dissent, that it is often cited. Hmm. And we, what we have on the opposite side of that is President Trump's own appointee to head the FBI. Remember, the FBI is a 10-year term job that's supposed to survive multiple presidents. Um, Christopher Wray has said before the Congress, when he has been called to testify on one or many of his numerous times have been called, has said that if a for, someone from, for, from a foreign government contacts you in a campaign about information and dirt on your opponent, that what do you do? You call the FBI. Mm. That's what he said. Right, right. Um, and again, I know that this was raised during the, the trial, uh, the, the fact that the president in an interview with uh, ABC News, yeah. when he was asked directly, if you got some information that was coming to you from a foreign source and particularly a foreign leader, what would you do? And the president said he would he would, he yes. would listen to it. And so did Rudy Giuliani yeah. uh, in one of many of his interviews say exactly the same thing. And many of us who uh, believe in the rule of law were horrified at that. And again, would go back and cite Christopher Wray. Uh, this is the head of the FBI. He knows what a crime is and what a crime isn't. You are not supposed to take information from a foreign government that will influence an election. It's as basic as the arguments of the founding fathers on why they put impeachment in the first place. Indeed. Uh, all right, uh, Ricky Kleeman, uh, we see some senators there walking by. Uh, cameras, I don't know if uh, Senator Klobuchar is going to stop. None of them have been stopping to talk to reporters. Uh, but we'll keep an eye out on that uh, camera and the group of reporters and senators as they make their way uh, within the Hill there. Let us take a quick break right now. We'll regroup and we'll come back with a lot more. Stick around. Wherever we have to go. We've just flown along the coastline. Whatever we have to do. The night police were throwing the first round of tear gas. Every evening we are focused. This is the main highway to the hardest hit areas. On finding and telling the truth. How does that hamper or hurt our national security? Even among the ashes, you can see the signs of deforestation. And earning your trust. You traveled the whole way with your son? The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Our nation's capital, decisions are made here that affect all of us. So join us every evening as we bring you CBS News original reporting from around the world while keeping our eye on what's going on right here in Washington. 
Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. A police discovered a motive. Does the president have a red line here? What can voters there expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning. All right, live look there at Capitol Hill. We're in the midst of a break as uh, the Senate is expected soon to reconvene to continue hearing uh, closing arguments in the Senate impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. Ricky Kleeman is here with me. We've been uh, all morning long, Ricky, talking about uh, some of the things that we've heard. And I guess it'll be interesting. You, you, you pointed out how um, you were, we left the conversation before the break talking about Alan Dershowitz and some of his um, arguments that he made on the floor of the Senate. But then we also pointed out, you did, that, uh, that the president's defense did make uh, uh, some points that even uh, some Democrats uh, afterwards when they went before the cameras uh, found convincing. I don't mean Democrats that are still in the Senate, but some of those who are no longer uh, members of the Senate uh, who are retired or who've, um, you know, moved on, uh, that there were some points that the defense were, were making that if you were a reasonable person, you could say, well, yes, that does make sense. Although the Democrats were able to counter some of those arguments. For example, one of the points that were that was made is that the president was intent on rooting out corruption. But then the Democrats were able to come back and say, OK, how often had President Trump mentioned corruption specifically? specifically as it relates to Ukraine before Vice President Biden decided to jump or decided to announce his candidacy for the presidency. Um, were there, were, were the, if you are a Mitt Romney and you're listening to some of the defense arguments there, were there things that you heard that made sense to you? The, uh, the person actually who has gotten very little credit for sounding like he had common sense and being just plain sensible mm -hmm. really was Jay Sekulow. Um, I think that secular is very underrated uh, during these hearings and that he, uh, what he was basically saying, um, which is really the Lamar Alexander answer, mm -hmm. which is Lamar Alexander in choosing not to hear witnesses um, and ultimately, of course, to vote for acquittal, was saying is that, um, no, the phone call was not perfect. Um, contrary to the president's um, uh, repetitive commentary that the phone call was perfect, or the phone call may not have been perfect, um, that, uh, uh, that the conduct Lamar Alexander says was inappropriate. Um, the Republicans have certainly not said uh, that, it, that word exactly, mm -hmm. but that they, they've certainly said it doesn't amount to impeachment. And what was argued was this. We have an election um, in a number of months, and that Lamar Alexander and some of the Republican managers were our uh, Republican defenders were arguing that what this is really about is taking away the ability of the public to vote in the 2020 election, removing Donald Trump's name from the ballot, and that really it belongs on the ballot in November. Mm. Now, they also argued that this is a matter of foreign policy. It was a foreign policy differential and the fear that um, different people, different parties will uh, then say, well, my foreign policy is different than your foreign policy and therefore mine is better and that therefore I can look at yours and create it into an impeachment situation. The other part of the argument that I think is probably the most well taken legally from the Republican side, um, that you can have other people who are reasonable people who can hang their hat on it, mm -hmm. is the fact of why didn't the House call John Bolton? Well, here's the, here's the thing I keep thinking about too, Ricky, is you're, you're starting to see already, the president has made comments about this, uh, some members, some Republicans in the House have commented on this, the idea that the Democrats rushed into yes. this impeachment. So just for our viewers who uh, may be confused when they hear that would, for a lot of people, um, th th what's been happening in this country since the election of Donald Trump has perhaps seen by some people who don't live it and breathe it every single day as one long sustained response to his presidency through uh, the Mueller report and now through the impeachment process. Um, 
when someone says the, 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 the Congress should have gone to the courts first to, uh, before they rush this to the Senate, what, are they, what do they mean by that? And what is the time, the time frame that made it perhaps not opportune for the Congress to do so? Well, that, of course, was Jonathan Turley's argument right. uh, before the Judiciary Committee, that you uh, needed to subpoena John Bolton, which the House did, but then they decided not to follow it through, that because the House... Pardon me, the House managers were really still stuck, the, the, excuse me, the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Committee were still stuck in the world of looking at the Don McGahn issue, who was the former counsel to President Trump, which goes back to complaints of corruption in the Mueller report, that, um, that the Don McGahn issue is still in the courts. So what the House had originally said through the committees, the Intelligence Committee and particularly the Judiciary Committee, and the final vote to impeach, was that this was a matter of national security. This was a matter that time was of the essence. Because we're not talking about what Donald Trump did in the 2016 election that is so critical in terms of time. What's critical in terms of time is that He's doing it in the 2020 election because he only went forth about corruption in the Ukraine when he was looking at Joe Biden, who was then the putative favorite as an opponent against him. And so he was there to discredit Biden using Ukraine as really a puppet because he wasn't really interested in an investigation about corruption. He was interested in an announcement about an investigation in corruption. So the House said, well, we don't have time to wait for the courts, because if we let this go on while waiting for the court three months, six months, nine months, we're going to be right at the election. And by then, it could be stolen through cheating by working with a foreign power. Uh, Ricky Kleeman, always so great to talk to you about this stuff because, um, it, you know, a lot of it comes at us so quickly and there are so many terms, legal and otherwise, thrown at us, meaning I put myself in the realm of the public when we're watching these things. And uh, it's so great to have you here to help us uh, understand it all and break it all down and remind us of things that we should keep in the back of our minds as we watch all these uh, proceedings play out. Uh, we are expecting that the proceedings will continue to play out. Uh, there you see uh, Senator Jones. Ernst uh, taking some questions from reporters. We'll keep an eye on that camera as well and continue the discussion uh, as we await for the Senate to reconvene and resume their closing arguments. Iowa is just hours away from kicking off its Democratic nominating contest. Candidates are making their final push to rally support before people from across the state gather and vote, but not on ballots but with their feet, moving into groups for each candidate. As Major Garrett reports, this happens in arenas, schools, firehouses, gym gymnasiums, a tiny bar even, in the middle of farm country. Plant, Iowa, 90 minutes west of Des Moines and surrounded by corn and cattle fields is one of Iowa's smallest towns. Population, 90. This year, for the first time, Grant will hold a Democratic caucus. The venue? The Hayloft, a rustic bar and grill where farm antiques are plentiful, and a hamburger goes for $2.50. Zelda Schwartz, age 74, has run the place for 48 years. So you know most of your customers? Oh, yes. I pretty much know what most of them's going to eat or drink. And <laughs> when Grant's Firehouse declined to host the caucus, the Democratic Party asked Zelda. I'm going to be very honest. When he first called me, he didn't say they were Democrats, but that made no difference to me. It may not have made a difference, but there is a difference. They're Democrats and I'm a Republican. <laughs> you welcome them with open arms? You bet. They're, I've met a lot of them and they're all very nice people. The Hayloft will be one of 1,678 caucus sites in Iowa's 99 counties. Those who attend will align into candidate preference groups. To qualify for delegates, a candidate must receive at least 15% support at each site. If a candidate doesn't meet that minimum, those supporters can pick another candidate. This is called realignment. Troy Price is the Iowa Democratic Party chair. We at the party have been preparing for record turnout plus uh, from the very beginning. And so when we started putting this process together back a year ago, uh, we went to go get the biggest rooms. Zelda will host the caucus in the Hayloft's roomy and knick-knack filled back room. 
Do you have any idea how many people are going to show up? No, I do not. They can seat 125 people. More than the so, whole town, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> For more on the Iowa caucuses, we're joined by CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. He is in Des Moines, of course. So, Ed, the Democratic Party is trying something new in the Iowa caucus. What's the change? A few changes, Anne Marie. Good to see you guys. First of all, they're going to release the results, the raw vote total from that first round that Major mentioned to give us a sense of who got how much, regardless of if they got 15 percent. Then they will release the final round number, the raw total again, to give us a sense of who actually prevailed. And then they'll give us a sense of how many delegates are going to each of these contenders. Why are they doing that? Because in 2016, there were concerns that the party was putting its thumb on the scale for Hillary Clinton. Bernie Sanders supporters and other fans of transparency said, why not just put it all out there for people to see? The concern for some of the campaigns is that somebody who does very well in that popular vote total in the first round might try to declare victory off of that. But remember, a viewer's guide, it only matters in terms of delegates tonight who won the Iowa caucus. The other thing that's interesting, caucuses are held at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 7 here in the central time zone. One time, it does limit the participation of people who have to work at night or can't get out in the cold. They are holding what are called satellite caucuses. Several here across the state this afternoon, some even in other parts of the country and the world where Iowa Democrats will be able to gather and pick a preferred candidate. Hmm. So, Ed, nobody does this better than you explaining to our viewers uh, how this all works. Uh, just drill down and explain why the Iowa Democratic Party uh, are releasing these three sets of results and what kind of role they will have on the upcoming caucuses and primaries in New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. Well, they only reward 41 of the more than 3,000 delegates the Democrats dole out ahead of the convention, and you need about 1,990 to win. So there's only about 1% of the delegates at stake here tonight, despite all the attention that's given to this state. Again, the raw totals are being released because there were concerns four years ago that the party may not have been totally straight with people about how it is that Hillary Clinton ended up winning. So the idea is to let everyone see all the math, but again, only focus on that delegate count. There is concern among some campaigns that, let's say, Bernie Sanders does very well in that first round of voting and may also prevail in the second round. But for whatever reason, and there are reasons, he doesn't end up with the most delegates. And the reason that could happen is because, let's say he goes to a, he does very well in a populated county of here in Des Moines or in Iowa City. Well, each precinct in each county is only awarded a certain number of delegates, no matter how many people show up and no matter how much you win by. If your support, however, is spread out broader across the whole state, you could win more delegates that way. And if you look at the CBS News Battleground Tracker results that we put out yesterday, it shows that Joe Biden's support, for example, is far more generously spread across the entire state, whereas Sanders appears to be bunched up in Des Moines, Iowa City, uh, Ames, uh, Cedar Rapids, areas where there are younger voters, more college voters, uh, and, and, and people who are going to caucus for the first time. So there's concern that certain campaigns might come out and say, look, we got more votes, but you didn't get all the delegates. And that's just the funky way that Iowa does it. Well, so that's an interesting point, Ed, because what's the byproduct of a campaign blasting out that, you know, they won, Iowa won, I put in air quotes, um, without really having all the delegates? Could that, for example, dampen turnout later on in the day or in the evening? Yep. And that is why they don't want them to do it. But the numbers will be there for them to do it if, if for whatever reason, the first round math is breaking in their way. Mm. Uh, these are the kinds of headaches and, uh, and debates that Democrats have amongst themselves. And I suspect 24 hours from now, uh, we could be looking at some of this math and see certain people arguing that they won when in reality they didn't. The only number that matters tonight, folks, is the delegate count. Good point. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, so uh, over the weekend, it was crunch time for the Democratic candidates. Um, four out of the five are senators, uh, top five are senators, and so they had to sit out during the week. So what were they busy doing uh, during the final moments leading up to today? Meeting with as many voters as they possibly could, Anne-Marie, and when one sign of how desperate they were to do that. Remember, we have, we've done stories. We've talked about the fact that Elizabeth Warren has spent almost a year taking photos with supporters and they have a very elaborate system to do that that can take several hours in some cases well this time over the weekend in several places 
She was only taking group photos with dozens or hundreds of people at once because she had to rush out the door to get to another event. She left her dog behind, <laughs> Bailey, to take individual photos with people <laughs> if they so chose. That's pretty funny. Um, uh, so uh, what are you hearing in terms of how uh, th uh, this is all going to play out? Yeah. I, I find it really remarkable, Ed, that um, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg uh, is not focused at all on these early states. He's not worried about Iowa. He's not worried about New Hampshire. As you point out, it represents such a small percentage of the overall delegate count. What I guess I'm trying to understand, does it, does it make sound political sense to say, look, uh, Florida and California, we're talking about, you know, you know hundreds of delegates. I got to spend my money there. Florida is all about these 30-second ads, I'm told, right? right, where Bloomberg has the money to spend. And coupled with that, that he's getting into the president's head. You see the president tweeting more about Michael Bloomberg, uh, making comments more about Michael Bloomberg. What do you, does that make sound political strategy to you? It would make sense if on March 3rd, Super Tuesday, he is winning at least 15 percent of the vote and starting to amass delegates. Those are the states he's competing in first. There's 14 of them, plus America, Samoa. Um, that's where most of the advertising is pointed right now. Yes, he's skipping the first four, believing that by focusing on California and Texas, Colorado, Alabama, uh, Arkansas, places like that, he could amass enough delegates to become a contender into the later rounds. That strategy works, again, if he hits 15% on Super Tuesday or more. And also, if after these first four, we emerge with two or three people mm. who have won one or two or three of these states. Uh, if Biden prevails here tonight, does well in New Hampshire, and wins South Carolina outright, it makes it harder for Mike Bloomberg to justify being the more moderate, middle-of-the-road, potential crossover candidate for independents and Republicans. But if Bernie Sanders wins here, wins in New Hampshire, wins Nevada, thanks to Latino support, and then Joe Biden wins in, uh, and a chastened Joe Biden wins in South Carolina, Super Tuesday voters may turn and say, well, wait a second. Biden hasn't been able to beat Bernie Sanders. Maybe Bloomberg can. Mm. Maybe we should support him. So lots of ifs, ands, and buts there mm -hmm. for Bloomberg to consider. Uh, but it's one possible strategy. Nobody's been able to test it before. You can only really do that, it seems, if you've got at least $52 billion to your name. <laughs> Precisely, Ed. So very few people will yeah, ever test right. that, except somebody like Mike Bloomberg. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> so one month into 2020, and the nation appears to be more divided than ever. In January, March for Life, the uh, Women's March, and a pro-gun rally in Virginia all took place. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> all right. Overly dramatic There's a hand lot of movement. stuff going on. So they all protests took place within seven days. So New York Times national correspondent Sabrina Savernisi interviewed protesters at all three of those demonstrations and she got a look at the political polarization and just how some Americans are struggling to pick a side. And Sabrina joins us now from Washington to discuss. Uh, so Sabrina, this is really interesting. Three different protests, three different causes, but one significant connection. What'd you find? So the connection was really these these people are, are partisans. They are very, very, very concerned and activated about politics right now. Um, and, and, you know, you would think that everybody in the country is, since we have Iowa today and, you know, politics is all that a lot of us are talking about. But actually, if you step back and look at the larger country, most people are not into politics. They don't follow politics. A majority do not. So these were the folks who do. And my curiosity was, you know, what is driving them? What, 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 uh, where are they? Where are their heads right now in America? And, and what I found was this really deep sense of almost. Let's turn back to the Senate floor now, where the president's legal team is presenting final arguments in the impeachment trial. Let's listen. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, House impeachment managers, and their very able staff. As uh, World War I, the war to end all wars, was drawing to a close, an American soldier sat down at a piano and composed a song. It was designed to be part of a musical review for his army camp out on Long Island. Suffolk County, 
The song was God Bless America. The composer, of course, was Irving Berlin, who came here at the age of five, son of immigrants who came to this country for freedom. As composers are wont to do, Berlin worked very carefully with the lyrics. The song needed to be pure. It needed to be above politics, above partisanship. He intended it to be a song for all America. But he intended it to be more than just a song. It was to be a prayer for the country. As your very distinguished chaplain, Admiral Barry Black, has done in his prayers on these long days that you've spent as judges in the high court of impeachment, we've been reminded of what our country is all about and that it stands for one nation under God. The nation is about freedom. And we hear the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. in his dream-filled speech about freedom, echoing the great passages inscribed on America's Temple of Justice, the Lincoln Memorial, which stood behind Dr. King as he spoke on that historic day. Dr. King is gone, felled by an assassin's bullet, but his words remain with us. And during his magnificent life, Dr. King spoke not only about freedom, freedom standing alone. He spoke frequently about freedom and justice. And in his speeches, he summed up regularly the words of a Unitarian abolitionist from the prior century, Theodore Parker who referred to the moral arc of the universe, the long moral arc of the universe, points toward justice, freedom and justice. Freedom whose contours have been shaped over the centuries in the English-speaking world by what Justice Benjamin Cardozo called the authentic forms of justice through which the community expresses itself in law. Authentic, authenticity. And at the foundation of those authentic forms of justice is fundamental fairness. It's playing by the rules. It's why we don't allow deflated footballs or stealing signs from the field. Rules are rules. They are to be followed. And so I submit that a key question to be asked as you begin your deliberations, were the rules here faithfully followed? If not, if that is your judgment, then with all due respect, the prosecutors should not be rewarded, just as federal prosecutors are not rewarded. You didn't follow the rules. You should have. As a young lawyer, I was blessed to work with one of the great trial lawyers of his time. And I asked him, Dit, what's your secret? He had just defended successfully a former United States senator who was charged with a serious offense, perjury, before a federal grand jury. His response was, simple and forthright. His words could have come from prairie lawyer Abe Lincoln. I let the judge and the jury know that they can believe and trust every word that comes out of my mouth. I will not be proven wrong. And so here's a question as you begin your deliberations. Have the facts as presented to you as a court, as the High Court of Impeachment, proven trustworthy? Has there been full and fair disclosure in the course of these proceedings? Fundamental fairness. I recall these words from the podium 
last week. A point would be made by one of the president's lawyers, and then this would follow. The house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? And again, the house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? At the Justice Department on the fifth floor of the Robert F. Kennedy Building is this simple inscription. The United States wins its point when justice is done its citizens in the courts. Not did we win, not did we convict, rather the moral question was justice done. Of course, as has been said frequently, the House of Representatives does, under our Constitution, enjoy the sole power of impeachment. No one has disputed that fact. They've got the power. But that doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that the House cannot be called to account in the High Court of Impeachment for its actions in exercising that power. A question to be asked, are we to countenance violations of the rules and traditional procedures that have been followed scrupulously in prior impeachment proceedings? And the Judiciary Committee, the venerable Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, Compare and contrast the thoroughness of that committee in the age of Nixon, its thoroughness in the age of Clinton with all of its divisiveness within the committee in this proceeding. A question to be asked. Did the House Judiciary Committee rush to judgment in fashioning the articles of impeachment? Did it cath carefully gather the facts, assess the facts, before it concluded we need nothing more than the panel of very distinguished professors and the splendid presentations by both the majority council and the minority council. We asked them questions. The Republicans asked them questions. We heard their answers. We're ready to vote. We're ready to try this case in the High Court of Impeachment. What was being said in the sounds of silence was this. We don't have time to follow the rules. We won't even allow the House Judiciary Minority members who have been beseeching us time and again to have their day just one day to call their witnesses. Oh yes, that is expressly provided for in the rules. We'll break those rules. That's not liberty and justice for all. The great political scientist of yesteryear, Richard Neustadt of Columbia, observed that the power of the president is ultimately the power to persuade. Oh yes, the commander in chief, and yes, charged with the conduct and authority to guide the nation's foreign relations. But ultimately, it's the power to persuade. I suggest to you that so too, the House's sole power to impeach is likewise ultimately a power to persuade over in the House? A question to be asked. In the fast-track impeachment process in the House of Representatives, the House majority persuade the American people. Not just partisans. Rather, did the House's case win over the overwhelming majority of consensus of the American people? The question fairly to be asked. Will I cast my vote to convict and remove the President of the United States when not a single member of the President's party, the party of Lincoln, was persuaded at any time in the process? 
In contrast, and when I was here last week, I noted for the record of these proceedings that in the Nixon impeachment, the House vote to authorize the impeachment inquiry was 410 to 4. In the Clinton impeachment, divisive, controversial, 31 Democrats voted in favor of the impeachment inquiry. Here, of course, and in sharp contrast, the answer is none. It is said that we live in highly and perhaps hopelessly partisan times. It is said that no one is open to persuasion anymore. They're getting their news entirely from their favorite media platform. And that platform of choice is fatally deterministic. Well, at least the decision of decision makers under oath who are bound by sacred duty, by oath or affirmation to do impartial justice, leaves the platforms out. Those modern day intermediaries and shapers of thought, of expression, of opinion are outside these walls where you serve. Finally, does what is before this court, very energetically described by the able house managers, but fairly viewed, rise to the level of a high crime or a misdemeanor, one so grave and so serious to bring about the profound disruption of the Article II branch, the disruption of the government, and to tell the American people, and yes, I will say, this is the way it would be read, your vote in the last election is hereby declared null and void. And by the way, we're not going to allow you, the American people, to sit in judgment on this president and his record in November. That is neither freedom nor is it justice. It's certainly not consistent with the most basic freedom of we, the people, the freedom to vote. I thank the court. I yield to my colleague, Mr. Pripura. Mr. Chief Justice. Members of the Senate, good afternoon. I will be relatively brief today and will not repeat the arguments that we've made throughout, but I just want to highlight a few things. There are a number of reasons why the articles of impeachment are deficient and must fail. My colleagues have spent the past week describing those reasons. In my time today, I'd like to review just a few core facts, which again, remember, are all drawn from the record on which the President was impeached in the House and that the House managers brought to this body in support of the President's removal. First, the President did not condition security assistance or a meeting on anything during the July 25 call. In fact, both Ambassador Yovanovitch and Mr. Tim Morrison confirmed that the Javelin missiles and the security assistance were completely unrelated. The concerns that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman expressed on the call were, by his own words and admission, based on deep policy concerns. And remember, as we said before, and everyone in this room knows, the President sets the foreign policy. The unelected staff implements the foreign policy. Others on the call, including Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's boss, Mr. Morrison, as well as Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, had no such concerns and have stated that they have heard nothing improper, unlawful, or otherwise troubling 
on the July 25 call. Second, President Zelensky and his top advisors agreed that there was nothing wrong with the July 25 call and that they felt no pressure from President Trump. President Zelensky said that the call was good, normal, and no one pushed me. President Zelensky's top advisor, Andrei Yermak, was asked if he had ever felt there was a connection between the U.S. military aid and the requests for investigations. He was adamant that we never had that feeling and we did not have the feeling that this aid was connected to any one specific issue. Several other top Ukrainian officials have said the same, both publicly and in readouts of the July 25 call to Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Volker, and others. Third, President Zelensky and the highest levels of the Ukrainian government did not learn of the pause until August 28, 2019, more than a month after the July 25 call between President Trump and President Zelensky. President Zelensky himself said, I had no idea the military aid was held up. When I did find out, I raised it with Pence at a meeting in Warsaw, referring to the Vice President. The meeting in Warsaw took place three days after the Politico article was published on September 1, 2019. Mr. Yermak likewise said that President Zelensky and his key advisors learned of the pause only from the August 28 Politico article. And just last week, while we were in this trial, Alexander Daniluk, former chairman of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, said he first found out that the U.S. was withholding aid to Ukraine by reading Politico's article published August 28. Mr. Daniluk also said there was panic within the Zelensky administration when they found out about the hold from the Politico article, indicating that the highest levels of the administration were unaware of the pause until the article was published. And if that's not enough, Ambassador Volker, Ambassador Taylor, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent, and Mr. Morrison all also testified that the Ukrainians did not know about the security hold until the Politico article on August 28. And we showed you the text message from Mr. Yermak to Ambassador Volker just hours after the Politico article was published. You also remember all of the high-level bilateral meetings at which the Ukrainians did not bring up the pause in the security assistance because they did not know about it. When they did find out on August 28, they raised the issue at the very next meeting in Warsaw on September 1st. This is a really important point. As Ambassador Volker testified, if the Ukrainians didn't know about the pause, then there was no leverage implied. That's why the House managers have kept claiming and continue to claim throughout the trial that the high-level Ukrainians somehow knew about the pause before late August. That's inaccurate. We pointed out that Laura Cooper, on whom they rely, testified that she didn't really know what the emails she saw relating to security assistance were about. We told you that Catherine Croft, who worked for Ambassador Volker, who worked for Ambassador Volker, couldn't remember the specifics of when she believed the Ukrainian embassy learned of the pause and that she didn't remember when news of the pause became public. The House managers also mentioned Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who claimed to have vague recollections of fielding unspecified queries about aid from Ukrainians in the mid-August time frame. But Lieutenant Colonel Vindman ultimately agreed that the Ukrainians first learned about the hold on security assistance probably around when the first stories emerged in the open source. And former Deputy Foreign Minister Olena Zirkal's claim that she knew about the pause in July is inconsistent with statements by her boss, the then Foreign Minister of Ukraine, who said that he learned of the pause from a news article, of which the August 28 Politico article was the first, as well as those of all of the other top-level Ukrainian officials I've mentioned, the testimony of the top U.S. diplomats responsible for Ukraine, and the many intervening meetings at which the pause was not mentioned. Fourth, none of the House witnesses testified that President Trump ever said there was any linkage between security assistance and investigations. When Ambassador Sondland asked the President on approximately September 9, the President told him, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. Before he asked the President, Ambassador Sondland presumed 
and told Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison that there was a connection between the security assistance and the investigations. That was before he asked the President directly. Even earlier, on August 31, Senator Ron Johnson asked the President if there was any connection between security assistance and investigations. The President answered, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? Under Secretary of State David Hale, Mr. Kent, and Ambassador Volcker all testified that they were not aware of any connection whatsoever between security assistance and investigations. The House managers repeatedly point to a statement by Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney during an October press conference. When it became clear that the media was misinterpreting his comments or that he had simply misspoken, Mr. Mulvaney promptly on the very day of the press conference, issued a written statement making clear that there was no quid pro quo. Here's a statement. Let me be clear. There was absolutely no quid pro quo between Ukrainian military aid and any investigation into the 2016 election. The President never told me to withhold any money until the Ukrainians did anything related to the server. The only reasons we were holding the money was because of concern about lack of support from other nations and concerns over corruption. Accordingly, Mr. Mulvaney in no way confirmed a link between the pause security assistance and investigations. A garbled or misinterpreted statement or a mistaken statement that is promptly clarified on the same day as the original statement is not the kind of reliable evidence that would lead to the removal of the President of the United States from office. And in any event, Mr. Mulvaney also stated during the press conference itself, that the money held up had absolutely nothing to do with Biden. Now, why does this all matter? I think Senator Romney really got to the heart of this issue on Thursday evening when he asked both parties whether there is any evidence that President Trump directed anyone to tell the Ukrainians that security assistance was being held up on the condition of an investigation into the Bidens. That was the question. There is no such evidence. Fifth, the security assistance was released when the President's concerns with burden sharing and corruption were addressed by a number of people, including some in this chamber today, without Ukraine ever announcing or undertaking any investigations. You have heard repeatedly that no one in the administration knew why the security assistance was paused. That's not true. Two of the House managers' own witnesses testified regarding the reason for the pause. As Mr. Morrison testified, at a July meeting attended by officials throughout the executive branch agencies, the reason provided for the pause by a representative from the Office of Management and Budget was that the President was concerned about corruption in Ukraine and he wanted to make sure that Ukraine was doing enough to manage that corruption. Further, according to Mark Sandy, Deputy Associate Director for National Security at the Office of Management and Budget, we had received requests for additional information on what other countries were contributing to Ukraine. We told you about the work that was being done to monitor and collect information about anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine and burden sharing during the summer pause. We told you about how, when President Zelensky asked Vice President Pence in Poland about the pause, Vice President Pence asked, according to Jennifer Williams, what the status of his reform efforts were that we, he could then convey back to the President and also wanting to hear if there was more that European countries could do to support Ukraine. Mr. Morrison, who was actually at the Warsaw meeting, testified similarly that Vice President Pence delivered a message about anti-corruption and burden sharing. We told you about the September 11 call with President Trump Senator Portman and Vice President Pence. Mr. Morrison testified the entire process, culminating in the September 11 call, gave the President the confidence he needed to approve the release of the security sector assistance, all without any investigations being announced. Now, I've focused so far on the House manager's allegation that there was a quid pro quo for the security assistance. Let me turn very briefly to the claim that a presidential meeting was also conditioned on investigations. Remember, by the end of the July 25 call, President Trump had personally invited President Zelensky 
to meet three times, twice by phone, once in a letter, without any preconditions. You heard that the White House was working behind the scenes to schedule the meeting and how difficult scheduling those meetings can be. The two presidents planned to meet in Warsaw, just as President Zelensky requested on the July 25 call. President Trump had to cancel at the last minute due to Hurricane Dorian. President Trump and President Zelensky then met three weeks later in New York without Ukraine announcing any investigations. Finally, one thing that the House managers' witnesses agreed upon was that President Trump has strengthened the relationship between the U.S. and Ukraine and that he has been a better friend to Ukraine and stronger opponent of Russian aggression than President Obama. Most notably, Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Volker, and Ambassador Yovanovitch all testified that President Trump's reversal of his predecessor's refusal to send the Ukrainians lethal aid was a meaningful and significant policy development and improvement for which President Trump deserves credit. Just last week, Ambassador Volker, who knows more about U.S.-Ukraine relationships than nearly, if not everyone, published a piece in Foreign Policy magazine. I'd like to read you an excerpt. Beginning in mid-2017 and continuing until the impeachment investigation began in September 2019, U.S. policy toward Ukraine was strong, consistent, and enjoyed support across the administration, bipartisan support in Congress, and support among U.S. allies and in Ukraine itself. The Trump administration also coordinated Ukraine policy closely with allies in Europe and Canada, maintaining a united front against Russian aggression and in favor of Ukraine's democracy, reform, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Ukraine policy is one of the few areas where U.S. and European policies have been in lockstep. The administration lifted the Obama-era ban on the sale of lethal defensive arms to Ukraine, delivering, among other things, Javelin anti-tank missiles, Coast Guard cutters, and anti-sniper systems. Despite the recent furor over the pause in U.S. security assistance this past summer, the circumstances of which are the topic of impeachment hearings, U.S. defensive support for Ukraine has been and remains robust. And more, according to Ambassador Volker. It is therefore a tragedy for both the United States and Ukraine that U.S. partisan politics, which have culminated in the ongoing impeachment process, have left Ukraine and its new reform-minded President Vladimir Zelensky exposed and relatively isolated. The only one who benefits from this is Russian President Vladimir Putin. Those are the words of Ambassador Volker. He was one of the House managers' key witnesses. He was the very first witness to testify in the House proceedings on October 3rd. And so I think it's fitting that he may be the last witness we hear from. In his parting words, Ambassador Volker admonishes that it is U.S. partisan politics which have culminated in this impeachment process that have imperiled Ukraine. In sum, the House manager's case is not overwhelming and it is not undisputed. The House managers bear the very heavy burden of proof. They did not meet it. It's not because they didn't get the additional witnesses or documents that they failed to pursue. It's because their own witnesses have already offered substantial evidence undermining their case. And importantly, as you have heard from Professor Dershowitz and from Mr. Philbin, the first article does not support or allege an impeachable offense regardless of any additional witnesses or documents. Members of the Senate, it has been an incredible honor and privilege to speak to you in this chamber. I hope that what I've shown has been helpful to your understanding of the facts, and I respectfully ask you to vote to acquit the President of the wrongful charges against him. I yield to Mr. Philbin. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, We've heard repeatedly throughout the past week and a half or so that the President is not above the law, 
And I'd like to focus in my last remarks here on an equally important principle, which is that the House of Representatives also is not above the law in the way they conduct the impeachment proceedings and bring a matter here before the Senate. Because in very significant and important respects, they didn't follow the law. From the outset, they began an impeachment inquiry here without a vote from the House and therefore without lawful authority delegated to any committees to begin an impeachment inquiry against the President of the United States. That was unprecedented in our history. The Speaker of the House does not have authority by holding a press conference to delegate the sole power of impeachment from the House to a committee. And the result was 23 totally unauthorized and invalid subpoenas were issued as a beginning of this impeachment inquiry. After that, the House violated every principle of due process and fundamental fairness in the way the hearings were conducted. And we've been through that. I'm not going to go through the details again. But it's significant because denying the President the ability to be present through counsel, to cross-examine witnesses, and to present evidence fundamentally skewed the proceedings in the House of Representatives. It left the President without the ability to have a fair proceeding, and it meant it reflected the fact that those proceedings were not truly designed as a search for truth. We have procedural protections. We have the right of cross-examination as a mechanism for getting to the facts. And that was not present in the House of Representatives. And lastly, Manager Schiff, as an interested witness who had been involved in, or at least his staff, in discussions with the whistleblower, then guided the factual inquiry in the House. So why does all of this matter? It matters because the lack of the vote meant that there was no democratic accountability and no lawful authorization for the beginning of the process. It meant that there were procedural defects that produced a record that this chamber can't rely on for any conclusion other than to reject the articles of impeachment and to acquit the president. And it mattered because the president, in response to these, these uh, violations of the president's rights and to the failure to follow proper procedure, failure to follow the law, has rights of his own, rights of the executive branch to be asserted. And that's the president's response to the invalid subpoenas was that they're invalid and we're not going to comply with them. And the president asserted other rights of the executive branch. When there were subpoenas for his senior advisors to come and testify, along with virtually every president since Nixon, he asserted the principle of immunity of his senior advisors, that they could not be called to testify. And the president asserted the defects in subpoenas that called for um, executive branch officials to testify without the presence of agency counsel. All established principles that have been asserted before. Now, what do the House managers say in response? They accuse the president in their second article of impeachment, trying to assert obstruction, that this was unprecedented response, an unprecedented refusal to cooperate. It was unprecedented that 23 subpoenas were issued in a presidential impeachment inquiry without valid authorization from the House. The president's response was to a totally unprecedented attempt by the House to do that which it had no authority to do. They've asserted today and on other occasions that the president's legal arguments in response to these subpoenas, they've said that it's indiscriminate. There was just a blanket defiance. I think I've shown that that wasn't true. There were three very specific legal rationales provided by the executive branch as to different defects and different subpoenas. And there were letters explaining those defects. But there was no attempt by the House to attempt an accommodations process, even though the White House offered to engage in an accommodations process. There was no attempt by the House to use other mechanisms to resolve the differences with the executive branch. It was just straight to impeachment. Now, they've asserted today and on other occasions that the President's counsel, that I and my colleagues have made bad faith legal arguments that are just window dressing. Now, in an ordinary court of law, 
One doesn't accuse opposing counsel of making bad faith arguments lightly. And if you make that accusation, it has to be backed up with analysis. But there hasn't been analysis here. There's just been accusation. When the president asserts the immunity of his senior advisors, that's a principle that's been asserted by virtually every president since Nixon. And let me read you what Attorney General Janet Reno during the Clinton administration said about this exact immunity. She said that immediate advisors to the president are immune from being compelled to testify before Congress and that, quote, the immunity such advisors enjoy from testimonial compulsion by a congressional committee is absolute and may not be overborne by competing congressional interests, end quote. And she went on to say, quote, compelling one of the president's immediate advisors to testify on a matter of executive decision making would raise serious constitutional problems no matter what the assertion of congressional need, end quote. Was that bad faith? Was Attorney General Reno asserting that principle in bad faith and President Clinton? President Obama asserted the same principle for his senior political advisor. Was that bad faith? Of course not. These are principles defending the separation of powers that presidents have asserted for decades. President Trump was defending the institutional interests of the office of the presidency in asserting the same principles here. That is vital for the continued operation of the separation of powers. Now, House managers have also said that once the president asserted these defects in their subpoenas and resisted them, they had no time to do anything else. They had to just go straight to impeachment. They couldn't accommodate. They couldn't go through a contempt process. They couldn't litigate. But the idea that there is no time for dealing with that friction with the executive branch is really antithetical to the proper functioning of the separation of powers. It goes against part of the way the separation of powers is supposed to work. That interbranch friction is meant to take time to resolve. It's meant to slow things down and to be somewhat difficult to work through and to force the branches to work together to accommodate the interests of each branch, not just to jump to the conclusion that, well, we have no time for that. We have to assert absolute authority on one side of the equation. And this is something that Justice Brandeis pointed out in a famous dissent in Myers versus the United States, but has since been cited many times by the court majority. He said, quote, the doctrine of the separation of powers was adopted by the convention of 1787 not to promote efficiency. So he's saying not to make government move quickly, but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power. The purpose was not to avoid friction but by means of the inevitable friction incident to the distribution of the governmental powers among the departments to save the people from autocracy. That is a vitally important principle that the friction between the branches, even if it means taking longer, even if it means not jumping straight to impeachment, is part of the constitutional design. And it's required to force the branches to determine incrementally where their interests lie to resolve disputes incrementally and not to jump straight to the ultimate nuclear weapon of the Constitution. We've also heard from the House managers that everything the President did here, asserting prerogatives of his office, asserting principles of immunity, must be wrong, must be rejected because only the guilty will assert a privilege. Only the guilty won't allow evidence. That is definitely not a principle of American jurisprudence. It's antithetical to fundamental principles of our system of laws. As we pointed out in our trial memorandum in Border Kircher versus Hayes and in other decisions, the Supreme Court has made clear that the very idea of punishing someone for asserting rights or privileges or suggesting that asserting the right or privilege is evidence of guilt is contrary to basic principles of due process. And it takes on an even more uh, malignant tenor to it when that principle is asserted in the context of a dispute between the branches relating to the boundaries of their relative powers. Because what the House is essentially asserting in this case 
is that any assertion of the prerogatives of the office of the president, any attempt to maintain the principles of separation of powers of executive confidentiality that have been asserted by past presidents can be treated by the House as evidence of guilt. And here, their entire second article of impeachment is structured on the assumption that the House can treat the assertion of principles grounded in the separation of powers as an impeachable offense. I mean, boiled down to its essence, it is an assertion that defending the separation of powers, if the president does it in a way that they don't like, in a time that they don't like, can be treated as an impeachable offense. And that's an incredibly dangerous assertion. Because if it were accepted, it would fundamentally alter the balance between the different branches of our government. It would suggest, and Professor Turley explained this, Professor Dershowitz explained it here, that if Congress makes a demand on the executive and the executive resists, based on separation of powers principles that past presidents have asserted, Congress can nonetheless say, we've decided to proceed by impeachment. We have the sole power, and this is the principle they assert in the House Judiciary Committee report. We have the sole power of impeachment, that means we are the sole judge of our own actions. There's no need for accommodation. There's no need for the courts. We will determine that any resistance you provide is itself impeachable. That would fundamentally transform our government by essentially giving the House the same sort of power as a parliamentary system to use impeachment as, in effect, a vote of no confidence against a prime minister, not the way the framers set up our three-branch system of government with a powerful executive who would be independent from the legislature. That's why Professor Turley explained that the second article of impeachment here would be an abuse of power by Congress. It would make the executive dependent on Congress in a manner antithetical to the system that the framers envisioned. So why is it that there are all of these defects in the House manager's case for impeachment. Why are they asserting principles like only the guilty would assert privileges? That's not part of our system of law. Why are they asserting that if the executive resists, the House has the sole power to determine the boundaries of its own power in relation to the executive, also not something that is in our system of jurisprudence? I think it's because, and why, why the lack of due process in the proceedings below? I think as we've explained, it's because this was a purely partisan impeachment from the start. It was purely partisan and purely political. And that's something that the framers foresaw. And I'll point to one passage from Federalist Number 65, a number of different passages from that have been cited over the course of the past week. But I don't think this one has. It's just after Hamilton points out, he warns that an impeachment in the House could be the result of persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. And then he goes on. Though this latter supposition may seem harsh and might not likely often to be verified, yet it ought not to be forgotten that the demon of faction will, at certain seasons, extend his scepter over all numerous bodies of men. Now, that's very 18th century language. We don't talk about demons extending their scepter over men. But it's prescient nonetheless. We might not be comfortable with the terms, but it's accurate for what can happen. And that is what's happened in this impeachment. This was a purely partisan political process it was opposed bipartisanly in the House. It was done by a process that was not designed to persuade anyone or to get to the truth or to provide process and abide by past precedents. It was done to get it finished by Christmas on a political timetable. And it's not something that this chamber should condone. That in itself provides a sufficient and substantial reason for rejecting the articles of impeachment. Members of the Senate, it's been an honor to be able to address you over the past 
week and a half or two weeks. And I thank you for your attention, and I yield to Mr. Seculo. Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers. I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for your patience over these two weeks. I want to focus on one last point. We believe that we have established overwhelmingly that both articles of impeachment fail to allege impeachable offenses and that, therefore, both articles 1 and 2 must fail. This entire campaign of impeachment that started from the very first day that the President was inaugurated was a partisan one, and it should never happen again. For three years, this push for impeachment came straight from the President's opponents, and when it finally reached a crescendo, it put this body, the United States Senate, into a horrible position. I want to start by taking a look back. On the screen is a graphic of a Washington Post headline. On January 20th, 2017, the campaign to impeach President Trump has begun. This was posted 19 minutes after he was sworn in. I also want to play a video where members, as early as January 15th, 2017, before the President was sworn into office, were calling for his impeachment. I want to say this for Donald Trump, who I may well be voting to impeach. I think that uh, he hit, Donald Trump has already done a number of things which legitimately raise the question of impeachment. And I will fight every day until he is impeached. I rise today, Mr. Speaker, to call for the impeachment of the president of the United States of America. The main reason I'm interested is not so much to win the Senate, which is a byproduct, it's because I think he's committed impeachable offenses and he needs the scarlet eye, eye on his chest. But if we get to that point, then yes, I think that's grounds to start impeachment proceedings. So we're calling upon the House to begin impeachment hearings immediately. Why do you think that President Trump specifically should be impeached? Well, there are four, five reasons why we think he should be impeached. On the impeachment of Donald Trump, would you vote yes or no? I would vote yes. I would vote, I would vote to impeach. Because we're gonna go in there, we're gonna impeach the mother I introduced articles of impeachment in July of 2017. All I did yesterday was make sure that those articles did not expire. I'm concerned that if we don't impeach this president, he will get reelected. It is time to bring impeachment charges against him. My personal view is that uh, he richly deserves impeachment. One of the members of the House of Representatives said, we're bringing these articles of impeachment so he doesn't get elected again. And here we are, 10 months before an election, doing exactly what they predicted. The whistleblower's lawyer, Mr. Zaid, sent out a tweet on January 30th, 2017. Let me put that up on the screen. The coup has started. First of many steps, rebellion. Impeachment will follow ultimately. And here we are. What this body, what this nation, and what this president has just endured, what the House managers have forced upon this great body is unprecedented and unacceptable. This is exactly and precisely what the founders feared. This was the first totally partisan presidential impeachment in our nation's history, and it should be our last. What the House Democrats have done to this nation, to the Constitution, to the office of the President, to the President himself, and to this body is outrageous. They have cheapened the awesome power of impeachment, and unfortunately, of course, the country is not better for that. We urge this body to dispense with these partisan articles of impeachment for the sake of the nation for the sake of the Constitution. As we have demonstrably proved, the articles are flawed on their face. They were a product of a reckless impeachment inquiry that violated all notions of due process and fundamental fairness. And then incredibly, 
Incredibly, when these articles were finally brought to this chamber, without a single Republican vote, the managers then claimed that now, now they need more process. Now they need more witnesses. That all of the witnesses that they compiled and all the testimony that you heard was not enough. That your job was to do their job, the one, frankly, they failed to do. We've already said many times the charges themselves do not allege a crime or a misdemeanor, let alone a high crime or a misdemeanor. There is nothing in the charges that could permit the removal of a duly elected president or warrant the negation of an election and the subversion of the American people's will. And that should be whatever party you're affiliated with. You are being asked to do this when tonight citizens of Iowa are going to be caucusing for the first caucus for the presidential season, election season, for the Democratic Party. Tonight! I think there's one thing that's clear. The President has had a concern about other countries carrying their fair share of burdens of financial aid. No one can doubt, and I think we've clearly set forth the issue of corruption in Ukraine. The President's and the Administration's policy on evaluating foreign aid and the conditions upon which it's given have been clear. Mr. Papura laid that out in great detail. The bottom line is that the President's opponents don't like the President and they really don't like his policies. They objected to the fact that the President chose not to rely each and every time on the advice of some of his subordinates. Even though he, not those unelected bureaucrats who work for him, were elected to office. The president, under our constitutional structure, is the one who decides our nation's foreign policy. Here is a perfect example. The House managers brought this up frequently. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. He admitted on page 155 of his transcript testimony that he did not know if there was a crime or anything of that nature. That's his quote. But that he, again, quote, had deep policy concerns. So there you have it. The real issue is policy disputes. Elections have consequences. We all know that. And if you do not like the policies of a particular administration or a particular candidate, you are free and welcome to vote for another candidate. But the answer is elections, not impeachment. To be clear, in our country, in the United States, the president, elected by the American people, is, in the words of the Supreme Court, the sole organ of the federal government in the field of international relations and foreign policy for our government. No unelected bureaucrats, not unhappy members of the House of Representatives. And however you were to define high crimes and misdemeanors, there is no definition that includes disagreeing with a policy decision as an acceptable ground to removal of a President of the United States. None. The first article for, of impeachment is therefore constitutionally invalid and should be immediately rejected by the Senate. Now, as to the second article of impeachment, President Trump in no way obstructed Congress. The President acted with extraordinary transparency by declassifying releasing the transcript of the July 25th call and the earlier call. It is that July 25th call which is purportedly at the heart of the articles of impeachment. He did so soon after the inquiry was announced. And despite the fact that privileges apply that could have been asserted, he released them anyways in order to facilitate the House's inquiry and cut through all of it, all of the hearsay, all of the hysteronics, to get the transcript out. Now, I want to take a moment, because my colleague, Deputy White House Counsel Pat Philbin, addressed and over again, and you have too, phrases like, cover up. 
that the assertion of a privilege is a cover-up. Here's what the Supreme Court of the United States has said about privileges in a variety of contexts. To punish a person because he has done what the law allows him to do is a due process violation of the basic order, the basic sort. And for an agent of the state to pursue a course of action whose objective is to penalize a person's reliance on his constitutional rights is patently unconstitutional, and how much more so when you're talking about the President of the United States. How about this? And this goes in the context of assertions of privileges, other constitutional privileges. The allegation has been that if you assert a privilege, you're assumed to be guilty. That's been the assertion. Why would, why would you do that? Well, we've, we've explained at great length, and I do not want to go over that again, the importance of the executive privilege and what it means to separation of powers and the functioning of our government, but I will say this. As the Supreme Court has recognized in other contexts with other privileges, the privileges served to protect the innocent who otherwise might be ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. In another Supreme Court case, Quinn versus the United States, the privilege this court has stated was generally regarded then as now as a privilege of great value, a protection of the innocent. The opinion goes on to say, in a safeguard against heedless, unfounded, or tyrannical prosecutions. I trace for you, and I'm not going to do it again, how all of this started. All those years ago, three years ago, how all of this began. There is no point to go over that because that evidence is undisputed. And the FISA Court's most recent orders put that in fair play. We've talked about the fact that the House violated its own fundamental rules in a series of unlawful subpoenas. I won't go over that again. Mr. Philbin laid that out in great detail. But I do think it's important to note that when seeking the advice of the President's closest advisors, despite the well-known bipartisan guidance from the Department of Justice regarding immunity, the House managers asked, act as if it does not exist. They sought testimony on matters, on matters from the executive branch's confidential internal decision-making process on matters of foreign relations and national security, and that is when protections are at their highest level. Let's not forget that the House barred the attendance of executive branch counsel at witness proceedings when executive branch members were being examined. Notwithstanding these substantial abuses of process, the executive branch responded to each and every subpoena and identified the specific, sp specific deficiencies found in each. You cannot just remove constitutional violations by saying you didn't comply. You've heard that one recipient of a subpoena, and this is, in fact, we've talked about it a number of times, but I think as we, we wrap up, I think it's worth seeing, saying again, one subpoena recipient did seek a declaratory judgment as to the validity of the subpoena that he had received. It was set up to go to court. A judge was going to make a decision. The House withdrew the subpoena and mooted the recipient's case before the court could rule. Now, was it because they didn't like the judge that was selected? Was it because they didn't like the way the ruling was going to go? Was it they didn't mean to have that witness in the first place? Whatever the reason, there is one undisputed fact. As the case was in court, they mooted it out by removing the subpoena. The assertion of valid constitutional privileges cannot be an impeachable offense. And that's what Article 2 is based on, the obstruction of Congress. For the sake of the Constitution, for the sake of the office of the President, this body must stand as a steady bulk work against this reckless and dangerous proposition. It doesn't just affect this president. It affects every man or woman who occupies that high office. So as we said with the first article of impeachment, we believe the second article of impeachment is invalid. It should also be rejected. In passing the first article of impeachment, the House attempted to usurp the president's constitutional power to determine policy especially foreign policy. In passing the second article of impeachment, the House attempted to control the constitutional privileges and immunities of the executive branch. All of this 
while simultaneously disrespecting the framers' system of checks and balances, which designates the judicial branch as the arbiter of interbranch disputes. By approving both articles, the House of Representatives violated our constitutional order, illegally abused their power of impeachment in order to obstruct the President's ability to faithfully execute the duties of his office. These articles fail on their face as they do not meet the constitutional standard for impeachable offenses. No amount of testimony could change that fact. We've already discussed some of the specifics. I think um, Alexander Hamilton's been quoted a lot, and there's a reason. What has occurred over the past two weeks, really the past three months, is exactly what Alexander Hamilton and other founders of our great country feared. I believe that Hamilton was prophetic in Federal 65 when he warned how impeachment had the ability to agitate, his words, the passions of the whole community and divide it into parties more or less friendly or inimical to the accused. He warned that impeachment would, and I quote, connect itself with pre-existing fractions and will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence and interest on one side or on the other. He continued, the convention, it appears, thought the Senate, this body, most fit as the depository of this important trust. Those who best can discern the intrinsic difficulty of the thing will be the least hasty in condemning that opinion and will be most inclined to allow due weight to the arguments which may be supposed to have produced it. In the same Federalist 65, Hamilton regarded the members of this Senate not only as the inquisitors for the nation, but as the representatives of the, nations, the nation as a whole. He said these words, quote, where else than in the Senate could have been found a tribunal sufficiently dignified or significantly independent? What other body would be likely to feel confident enough in its own situation to preserve unawed and uninfluenced the necessary impartiality between an individual accused and the representatives of the people, his accusers. You took an oath. They questioned the oath. You are sitting here as a trier of fact. They said the Senate's on trial. Based on all of the presentations that we've made in our trial brief, and the arguments that we've put forward today, again, we believe both articles should be immediately, immediately rejected. Now, our nation's representatives holding office in this great body must unite today to protect our Constitution and separation of powers. And you know, there was a time not that long ago, even within this administration, where bipartisan agreements could be reached to serve the interests of the American people. Take a listen to this. Take a look. And today we had a beautiful bipartisan moment where Democrats and Republicans are working together uh, to keep that fentanyl out of our country, to use these devices uh, to accomplish that goal. It's not perfect. We need to do a lot more. But today was a very good step, and I want to praise uh, all of the people, Democrats and Republicans, and the President, for working together on this bill. As has been said, and we can see by the people assembled here, if we work together bipartisan way to get things done and this is a place where we can all agree that we've got to do more and where we can work together so I applaud everyone's efforts. We are proudly joined today by so many members of Congress, Republicans, Democrats, who worked very, very hard on this bill. This was really an effort of everybody. It was a bipartisan success, something you don't hear too much about. But I think you will be. I actually believe we maybe will be over the coming period of time. I hope so. I think so. It's so good for the country. Thank you, everybody. This was incredible bipartisan support. We passed this in the Senate, 87 to 12. That's unheard of. And then in the House, we passed it 358 to 36. Uh, be here to help celebrate uh, your signing uh, this uh, next step in this critical uh, women's growth and prosperity and development initiative. It dovetails nicely uh, with the Build Act, bipartisan bill you signed into law, um, with the WE Act, which recognizes this as a critical strategy. So I think this is a tremendous initiative. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is what the American people expect. 
I simply ask this body to stand firm today, protect the integrity of the United States Senate, stand firm today and protect the office of the President, stand firm today and protect the Constitution, stand firm today and protect the will of the American people and their vote, stand firm today and protect our nation, and I ask that this partisan impeachment come to an end to restore our constitutional balance, for that is, in my view and in our view, what justice demands and the Constitution requires. With that, Mr. Chief Justice, I yield my time to the White House Counsel, Mr. Pat Cipollone. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, members of the Senate. I will leave you with just a few brief points. First, I want to express, on behalf of our entire team, our gratitude. Our gratitude to you, Mr. Chief Justice, for presiding over this trial. Our gratitude to you, Leader McConnell. Our gratitude to you, Democratic Leader Schumer, and all of you on both sides of the aisle for your time and attention. I also want to express our gra my gratitude to our team. It's large. and. With a, with a large number of people who have helped in this effort. I won't name them all, but I want to thank them for their effort and their hard work in the de defense of the Constitution, in defense of the President, in defense of the American people's right to vote. I want to thank, as members of that team, the Republican members of the House of Representatives who have also been engaged in that effort throughout this entire, entire period of time and the Democrats in the House who voted against this partisan impeachment. And I also want to thank the President of the United States for his confidence in us to send us here to represent him, to all of you in this great body, and for all he has done on behalf of the American people. I would make just a couple of additional points. Number one, as we've said repeatedly, We've never been in a situation like this in our history. We have a bi a, a, an impeachment that is purely partisan and political. It's opposed by, bi by bipartisan members of the House. It does not even allege a violation of law. It is passed in an election year, and we're sitting here on the day that election season begins in Iowa. It is wrong. There is only one answer to that. And the answer is to reject those articles of impeachment, to have confidence in the American people, to have confidence in the result of the upcoming election, to have confidence and respect for the last election and not throw it out, and to leave the choice of the president to the American people, and to leave to them also the accountability for the members of the House of Representatives who did that. That's what the Constitution requires. Point number two, and I think that should be done on a bipartisan basis, and that's what I ask you to do. Point number two, I believe the American people are tired of the endless investigations and false investigations that have been coming out of the House from the beginning, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Sekulow, pointed out. It is a waste of tax dollars, it is a waste of the American people's time, and I would argue, more importantly, most importantly, the opportunity cost of that, the opportunity cost of that. What you could be doing, what the House could be doing, working with the President to achieve those things on behalf of the American people is far more important than the endless investigations, the endless false attacks the besmirching of the names of good people. This is something that we should reject together, and we should move forward in a bipartisan fashion and in the way that this president has done successfully. He's achieved successful results in the economy and across so many other areas, working with you on both sides of the aisle, and he wants to continue to do that. And that's what I believe the American people want those of you elected to come here to Washington to focus on, to spend your time on, to unify us, as opposed to the bitter division that is caused by these types of proceedings. 
So we, at the end of the day, we put our faith in the Senate. We put our faith in the Senate because we know you will put your faith in the American people. You will leave this choice to them where it belongs. We believe that they should choose the president. We believe that this president, day after day, has put their interests first, has achieved a successful results, has fulfilled the promises he made to them, and he is eager to go before the American people in this upcoming election. At the end of the day, that is the only result. It is a result, I believe, guided by your wise words from the past, that we can together end the era of impeachment, that we can together put faith in the American people, put faith in their wisdom, put faith in their judgment. That's where our founders put the power. That's where it belongs. And I urge you, on behalf of those Americans, of every American, on behalf of all of your constituents, to reject these articles of impeachment. It's the right thing for our country. The president has done nothing wrong. And these types of impeachments must end. You will vindicate the right to vote. You will vindicate the Constitution. You will vindicate the rule of law by rejecting, by rejecting these articles. And I ask you to do that on a bipartisan basis this week and end the era of impeachment once and for all. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to us, for your attention, and for considering our case on behalf of the President. I come here today to ask you, reject these articles of impeachment. Reject these articles of impeachment. I thank you for granting us the permission to appear here in the Senate on behalf of this President. And I ask you, on his behalf, on behalf of the American people, to reject these articles. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, it's a problem that here at the end of the trial, the President's lawyers still dispute the meaning of high crimes and misdemeanors. Some say it requires an ordinary crime or that if the President misbehaves when he thinks it's good for the country, it's okay. Neither is correct. We need to clear this up by looking at what the Founders said. When the Founders created the Presidency, they gave the President great power. They'd just been through a war to get rid of a king with too much power, and they needed a check on the great power given to the President. It was late in the Constitutional Convention that they turned to the Impeachment Clause. Madison argued in favor of impeachment. He said it was indispensable. Mason asked, quote, shall any man be above justice? Above all, shall that man be above it who can commit the most extensive injustice? Randolph defended the propriety of impeachment since, quote, the executive will have great opportunity of abusing his power. Now, the original draft of the Constitution provided for impeachment only for treason or bribery. Mason asked, quote, why is the provision restrained to treason and bribery only? Treason, as defined in the Constitution, will not reach many great and dangerous offenses, and he added, Hastings is not guilty of treason. Attempts to subvert the Constitution might not be treason as defined. Now, Hastings' impeachment in Britain at this time was well known and it wasn't limited to a crime. They considered adding the word maladministration to capture abuse of presidential power, but Madison objected. He said so vague a term would be equivalent to tenure during the pleasure of the Senate. So maladministration was withdrawn and replaced with the more certain term, high crimes and misdemeanors, because the founders knew the law. 
Blackstone's commentaries, which Madison said was a book in every man's hand, described high crimes and misdemeanors as offenses against king and government. Hamilton called high crimes and misdemeanors, quote, those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. During ratification, Randolph in Virginia cited the president's receipt of presents or emoluments from a foreign power as an example. And Mason's example was a president who would, quote, pardon crimes which were advised by himself or before indictment or conviction, quote, to stop inquiry and prevent detention, uh, detection. It's clear they knew what they wrote. The president's lawyers tried to create a muddle to confuse you. Don't let them. High crimes and misdemeanors mean abuse of power against the constitutional order, conduct that is corrupt, whether or not a crime. Now, some say no impeachment when there's an election coming, but without term limits when they wrote the Constitution, there was always an election coming. If impeachment in election years was not to be, our founders would have said so. So here we are, Congress passed a law to fund Ukraine to fight the Russians who invaded their country. President Trump illegally held that funding up to coerce Ukraine to announce an investigation to hurt his strongest election opponent. He abused his power corruptly to benefit himself personally, and then he tried to cover it up. That's impeachable. The facts are clear, and so is the Constitution. The only question is what you, the Senate, will do. Now, our founders created a government where the tension between the three branches would prevent authoritarianism. No one of the branches would be allowed to grab all the power. Impeachment was to make sure the president, who had the greatest opportunity to grab power, would be held in check. It's a blunt instrument, but it's what our founders gave us. Some of the founders thought the mere existence of the impeachment clause would prevent misconduct by presidents, but sadly they were wrong, because twice in the last half century, a president corruptly used his power to try to cheat in an election. First Nixon, with Watergate and now another president corruptly abuses his power to cheat in an election. The founders worried about factions, what we'd call political parties. They built a system where each branch of government would jealously guard their power, not one where guarding the faction was more important than guarding the government. Opposing a president of your own party isn't easy. It wasn't easy when Republican Caldwell Butler voted to impeach Nixon in the Judiciary Committee. It wasn't easy for Senator Barry Goldwater to tell Nixon to resign. But your oath is not to do the easy thing. It's to do impartial justice. It requires conviction and removal of President Trump. Mr. Chief Justice, Counsel for the President, Senators. Since I was a little girl and started going to church, I've been inspired by the words in Scripture. Whatever you did for one of these least of my brothers, you did for me. We're called to always look out for the most vulnerable. Sometimes fighting for the most vulnerable means holding the most powerful accountable. And that's what we are here to do today. The American people will have to live with the decisions made in this chamber. In fact, senators, I believe that the decision in this case will affect the strength of democracies around the world. Democracy is a gift that each generation gives to the next one. If we say that this president can put his own interests above all else, even when lives are at stake, then we give our nation's children a weaker democracy than we inherited from those that came before us. The next generation deserves better. They are counting on us. 
I'm the Catholic, and my faith teaches me that we all need forgiveness. I have given this president the benefit of the doubt from the beginning. Despite my strong opposition to so many of his policies, I know that the success of our nation depends on the success of our leader. But he has let us down. Senators, we know what the president did and why he did it. This fact is seriously not in doubt. Senators on both sides of the aisle have said as much. The question for you now is, does it warrant removal from office? We say yes. We cannot simply hope that this president will realize that he has done wrong or inappropriate and hope that he does better. We have done that so many other times. We know that he has not apologized. He has not offered to change. We all know that he will do it again. What President Trump did this time pierces the heart of who we are as a country. We must stop him from further harming our democracy. We must stop him from further betraying his oath. We must stop him from tearing up our Constitution. The founders knew that in order for our republic to survive, we would need to be able to remove some of our leaders from office when they put their interests above the country's interest. Senators, we have proven that. This president committed what is called the ABCs of impeachable behavior, abusing his power, betraying the nation, and corrupting our elections. He deserves to be removed for taking the very actions that the framers feared would undermine our country. The framers designed impeachment for this very case. Senators, when I was growing up poor in South Texas, picking cotton, I confess, I didn't spend any time thinking about the framers. Like me, little girls and boys across America aren't asking at home what the framers meant by high crimes and misdemeanors. But someday, they will ask why we didn't do anything to stop this president who's put his, who put his own interests above what was good for all of us. They will ask. They will want to understand. Senators, we inherited a democracy. Now we must protect it and pass it on to the next generation. We simply can't give our children a democracy if their president is above the law. Because in this country, no one is above the law. Not me, not any of you, not even this president. Nadie está por encima de la ley. Nadie. This president must be removed. With that, I yield to my colleague, Mr. Crow. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, two weeks ago we started this trial promising to show you that the president withheld $391 million of foreign military aid to course an ally at war to help him win the 2020 election. And by many of your own admissions, we succeeded in showing you that, because the facts still matter. We also promised you that eventually all of the facts would come out, and that continues to be true. But we didn't just show you that the president abused his power and obstructed Congress. We painted a broader picture of President Trump, a picture of a man who thinks that the Constitution doesn't serve as a check on his power, but rather gives it to him in an unlimited way, a man who believes that his personal ambitions are synonymous with the good of the country, a man who, in his own words, thinks that if you're a star, they will let you do anything. In short, it's the picture of a man who will always put his own personal interests above the interests of the country that he has sworn to protect. But what's in an oath, anyway? 
Are they relics of the past? Do we simply recite them out of custom? To me, an oath represents a firm commitment to a life of service, a commitment to set aside your personal interest, your comfort, and your ambition to serve the greater good, a commitment to sacrifice. I explained to you last week that I believe America is great not because of the ambition of any one man, not simply because we say it's true, but because over our almost 250-year history, millions of Americans have taken the oath and they meant it. Many of them followed through on that oath by giving everything to keep it. But there is more to it than simply keeping your word because an oath is also a bond between people who have made a common promise. Perhaps the strongest example is the promise between the commander-in-chief and our men and women in uniform. Those men and women took the oath with the understanding that the commander-in-chief, our president, would always put the interests of the country in their interests above his own and understanding that his orders will be in the best interest of the country and that their sacrifice in fulfilling those orders will always serve the common good. But what we have clearly shown the last few weeks and what President Trump has shown us the past few years is that this promise flows only one way. As Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Many of us in this room are parents. We all try to teach our kids the important lessons of life. One of those lessons is that you won't always be the strongest, you won't always be the fastest, and you won't always win. There are a lot of things outside our control, but my wife and I have tried to teach our kids that what we can always control are our choices. It's in that spirit that hanging in my son's room is a quote from Harry Potter. The quote is from Professor Dumbledore, who said, It is our choices that show who we truly are, far more than our abilities. This trial will soon be over, but there will be many choices for all of us in the days ahead, the most pressing of which is how each of us will decide to fulfill our oath. More than our words, our choices will show the world who we really are. What type of leaders we will be and what type of nation we will be. So let me finish where I began with an explanation of why I am here standing before you. I've been carrying my kids' constitutions these last few weeks. And this morning I wrote a note to them to explain why I'm here. Our founders recognized the failings of all people, so they designed a system to ensure that the ideas and principles contained in this document would always be greater than any one person. It's the idea that no one is above the law. But our system only works if people stand up and fight for it. And fighting for something important always comes with a cost. Someday you may be called upon to defend the principles and ideas embodied in our Constitution. May the memory and spirit of those who sacrificed for them in the past guide you and give you strength as you fight for them in the future. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, and Counsel for the President. This is a defining moment in our history and a challenging time for our nation. A thousand things have gone through my mind since this body voted to not call witnesses in this trial. The vote was unprecedented. The President's former National Security Advisor indicated that he was willing to testify under oath before the Senate, yet this body did not want to hear what he had to say. The President's lawyers have asked you to not believe your lying eyes and ears, to reinterpret the Constitution, and to believe that if the President thinks his reelection is in our national interest, 
then he can do whatever he wants, anything, to make it happen. And that's exactly what he was attempting to do anything when he illegally held much-needed military aid while pressuring Ukraine's president to announce bogus investigations into his most feared political rival. This trial is about abuse of power, obstruction, breaking the law, and our system of checks and balances. And since we are talking about the President of the United States, this trial is also most certainly about character. I'm reminded today, Senators, of my own father. He worked more than one job. He didn't have a famous last name. His name appeared on no buildings. But my father was rich in something no money and apparently no powerful position can buy. You see, my father was a man who was decent, honest, a man of integrity. And he was a man of good moral character. The president's lawyer never spoke about the president's character during this trial. And I find that quite telling. I joined the police department because I wanted to make a difference. And I believe I did. As a police chief, I was always concerned about the message we were sending inside the agency, especially to young recruits, especially to newly hired, dedicated police officers. We had to be careful about just how we were defining what was acceptable and unacceptable behavior inside the department and out in the community. Yes, people make mistakes. Yes, individuals make mistakes. But we had to be clear about the culture inside the organization. And we had to send a strong message that the police department was not a place where corruption could reside, where corruption was normalized, and where corruption was covered up. Today, unfortunately, I believe we are holding young police recruits to a higher standard than we are the leader of the free world. If this body fails to hold this president accountable, you must ask yourselves what kind of republic will we ultimately have with a president who thinks that he can really, truly do whatever he wants. You will send a terrible message to the nation that one can get away with abuse of power, obstruction, cheating, and spreading false narratives if you simply know the right people. Well, today, Senators, I reject that because we are a nation of laws. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, said this, America will never be destroyed from outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we chose to destroy ourselves. I urge you, senators, to vote to convict and remove this president. Thank you so much for your time. Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished members of the Senate, President's Council. I mentioned on the floor last week that Alexander Hamilton has played a starring role 
during this impeachment trial. But Ben Franklin has only made a cameo appearance. But that cameo appearance was an important one. When he made the observation in the aftermath of that convention in 1787, that the framers of the Constitution had created a republic if you can keep it. Why would Dr. Franklin express ambiguity about the future of America during such a triumphant moment? Perhaps it was because the system of government that was created at that convention checks and balances separate and co-equal branches of government, the independent judiciary, the free and fair press, the preeminence of the rule of law, all of those values, all of those ideas, all of those institutions had never before been put together in one form of government. So perhaps it was uncertain as to whether America could sustain it. But part of the brilliance of our great country is that year after year, decade after decade, century after century, we've held this democracy thing together. But now, all of those ideas, all of those values, all of those institutions are under assault, not from without, but from within. We've created a republic if you can keep it. House managers have proven our case against President Trump with a mountain of evidence. President Trump tried to cheat, he got caught, and then he worked hard to cover it up. President Trump corruptly abused his power. President Trump obstructed a congressionally and constitutionally required impeachment inquiry with blanket defiance. President Trump solicited foreign interference in an American election and shredded the very fabric of our democracy. House managers have proven our case against President Trump with a mountain of evidence. If the Senate chooses to acquit under these circumstances, then America is in the wilderness. If the Senate chooses to normalize lawlessness, if the Senate chooses to normalize corruption, if the Senate chooses to normalize presidential abuse of power, then America is in the wilderness. If the Senate chooses to acquit President Trump without issuing a single subpoena, without interviewing a single witness, without reviewing a single new document, then America is truly in the wilderness. But all is not lost, even at this late hour. The Senate can still do the right thing. America is watching, the world is watching, the eyes of history are watching. The Senate can still do the right thing. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the seventh verse, encourages us to walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We've come this far by faith. And so I say to all of you, my fellow Americans, walk by faith. Democrats and Republicans, progressives and conservatives, the left and the right, all points in between, walk by faith. There are patriots all throughout this chamber, patriots who can be found all throughout the land, in urban America, rural America, suburban America, small town America, walk by faith. Through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, the trials and the tribulations of this turbulent moment. Walk by faith. Faith in the Constitution, faith in our democracy, 
Faith in the rule of law. Faith in government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Faith in Almighty God. Walk by faith. The Senate can still do the right thing. And if we come together as Americans, then together we can eradicate the cancer that threatens our democracy and continue our long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I want to begin by thanking you for the distinguished way you have presided over these proceedings. Senators, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. If Lincoln could speak these words during the Civil War, surely we can live them now and overcome our divisions and our animosities. It is midnight in Washington. The lights are finally going out in the Capitol after a long day in the impeachment trial of Donald J. Trump. The Senate heard arguments only hours earlier on whether to call witnesses and require the administration to release documents it has withheld. Counsel for the President still maintains the President's innocence while opposing any additional evidence that would prove otherwise. It is midnight in Washington. But on this night, not all the lights have been extinguished. Somewhere in the bowels of the Justice Department, Donald Trump's Justice Department, a light remains on. Someone has waited until the country is asleep to hit send to inform the court in a filing due that day that the Justice Department, the department that would represent justice, is refusing to produce documents directly bearing on the President's decision to withhold military aid from Ukraine. The Trump administration has them, it is not turning them over, and it does not want the Senate to know until it is too late. Send. That's what happened last Friday night when you left home for the weekend in a replay of the duplicity we saw during the trial when the President's lawyers argued here that the House must go to court and argued in court that the House must come here, they were at it again, telling the court in a midnight filing that it would not turn over relevant documents even as they argued here that they were not covering up the President's misdeeds. Midnight in Washington. All too tragic, a metaphor for where the country finds itself at the conclusion of the only the third impeachment in history and the first impeachment trial without witnesses or documents, the first such trial or non-trial in impeachment history. How did we get here? In the beginning of this proceeding, you did not know whether we could prove our case. Many senators, like many Americans, did not have the opportunity to watch much, let alone all, of the open hearings in the House during our investigation. And none of us could anticipate what defenses the President might offer. Now you have seen what we promised, overwhelming evidence of the President's guilt. Donald John Trump withheld hundreds of millions of dollars to an ally at war and a coveted White House meeting with their President to coerce or extort that nation's help to cheat in our elections. And when he was found out, he engaged in the most comprehensive effort to cover up his misconduct in the history of presidential impeachment, fighting all subpoenas for documents and witnesses, and using his own obstruction as a sword and a shield. Arguing here, the House did not fight hard enough to overcome their non-invocation of privilege in court, and in court that the House must not be heard to enforce their subpoenas, but that impeachment is a proper remedy. Having failed to persuade this Senate or the public that there was no quid pro quo, having offered no evidence to contradict the record, the President's team opted in a kind of desperation for a different kind of defense. First, prevent the Senate and the public from hearing from witnesses with the most damning accounts of the President's misconduct. And second, fall back on a theory of presidential power so broad and unaccountable that it would allow any occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania to be as corrupt as he chooses while the Congress is powerless to do anything about it. That defense collapsed of its own dead weight. 
Presidents may abuse their power with impunity, they argued. Abuse of power is not a constitutional crime, they claimed. Only statutory crime is a constitutional crime, even though there were no statutory crimes when the Constitution was adopted. The President had to look far and wide to find a de defense lawyer to make such an argument, unsupported by history, the founders, or common sense. The Republican expert witness in the House would not make it. Serious constitutional scholars would not make it. Even Alan Dershowitz would not make it. At least he wouldn't in 1998. But this has become the President's defense. And yet, this defense proved indefensible. If abuse of power is not impeachable, even though it is clear the founders considered the highest of all high crimes and misdemeanors, but if it were not impeachable, then a whole range of utterly unacceptable conduct in a president would now be beyond reach. Trump could offer Alaska to the Russians in exchange for support in the next election, or decide to move to Mar-a-Lago permanently and let Jared Kushner run the country, delegating to him the decision whether to go to war. Because those things are not necessarily criminal, this argument would allow that he could not be impeached for such abuses of power. Of course, this would be absurd. More than absurd, it would be dangerous. And so Mr. Dershowitz tried to embellish his legal creation and distinguish among those abuses of power which would be impeachable from those which wouldn't. Abuses of power that would help the president get reelected were permissible and therefore unimpeachable and only those for pecuniary gain were beyond the pale. Under this theory, as long as the president believed his re-election was in the public interest, he could do anything, and no quid pro quo was too corrupt. No damage to our national security too great. This was such an extreme view that even the president's other lawyers had to run away from it. So what are we left with? The House has proven the president's guilt. He tried to coerce an ally into helping him cheat by smearing his opponent. He betrayed our national security in order to do it when he withheld military aid to our ally and violated the law to do so. He covered it up, and he covers it up still. His continuing obstruction is a threat to the oversight and investigatory powers of the House and Senate, and if left unaddressed, will permanently and dangerously alter the balance of power. These undeniable facts required the president to retreat to his final defense. He's guilty as sin, but can't we just let the voters decide? He's guilty as sin, but why not let the voters clean up this mess? And here, to answer that question, we must look at the history of this presidency and to the character of this president, or lack of character, and ask, can we be confident that he will not continue to try to cheat in that very election? Can we be confident that Americans and not foreign powers will get to decide and that the president will shun any further foreign interference in our democratic affairs? And the short plain, sad, incontestable answer is no, you can't. You can't trust this president to do the right thing, not for one minute, not for one election, not for the sake of our country. You just can't. He will not change, and you know it. In 2016, he invited foreign interference in our election. Hey, Russia, if you're listening, hack Hillary's emails, he said, and they did immediately. And when the Russians started dumping them before the election, he made use of them in every conceivable way, touting the filthy lucre at campaign stops more than a hundred times. When he was investigated, he did everything he could to obstruct justice, going so far as to fire the FBI director and try to fire the special counsel and ask the White House counsel to lie on his behalf. During the same campaign, while telling the country he had no business dealings with Russia, he was continuing to actively pursue the most lucrative deal of his life, a Trump Tower in the heart of Moscow. Six close associates of the president would be indicted or go to jail in connection with the president's campaign, Russia, and the effort to cover it up. On the day 
after that tragic chapter appeared to come to an end with Bob Mueller's testimony. Donald Trump was back on the phone, this time with another foreign power, Ukraine, and once again seeking foreign help with his election. Only this time, he had the full powers of the presidency at his disposal. This time, he could use coercion. This time, he could withhold aid from a nation whose soldiers were dying every week. This time, he believed he could do whatever he wanted under Article 2. And this time, when he was caught, he could make sure that the Justice Department would never investigate the matter. And they didn't. Donald Trump had no more Jeff Sessions. He had just the man he wanted in Bill Barr, a man whose view of the imperial presidency, a presidency in which the Department of Justice is little more than an extension of the White House counsel, is to do the president's bidding. So Congress had to do the investigation itself. And just as before, he obstructed that investigation in every way. He has not changed. He will not change. He has made that clear himself without self-awareness or hesitation. A man without character or ethical compass will never find his way. Even as the most recent and most egregious misconduct was discovered, he was unapologetic, unrepented, and more dangerous, undeterred. He continued pressing Ukraine to smear his rivals even as the investigation was underway. He invited new countries to get involved in the act, calling on China to do the same. His personal emissary, Rudy Giuliani, dispatched himself to Ukraine, trying to get further foreign interference in our election. The plot goes on, the scheming persists, and the danger will never recede. He has done it before, he will do it again. What are the odds, if left in office, that he will continue trying to cheat? I will tell you, 100%. Not five, not 10, or even 50, but 100%. If you have found him guilty, and you do not remove him from office, he will continue trying to cheat in the election until he succeeds. Then what shall you say? What shall you say if Russia again interferes in our election and Donald Trump does nothing but celebrate their efforts? What shall you say if Ukraine capitulates and announces investigations into the president's rivals? What shall you say in future when candidates compete for the allegiance of foreign powers in their elections? when they draft their platforms so to encourage foreign intervention in their campaign. Foreign nations as the most super of super PACs of them all, if not legal, somehow permissible, because Donald Trump has made it so, and we refuse to do anything about it but wring our hands. They'll hack your opponent's emails, they'll mount a social media campaign to support you, they'll announce investigations of your opponent to help you, and all for the asking. Leave Donald Trump in office after you have found him guilty, and this is the future that you will invite. Now we have known since the day we brought these charges that the bar to conviction requiring fully two-thirds of the Senate may be prohibitively high. And yet the alternative is a runaway presidency and a nation whose elections are open to the highest bidder. And so you might ask how, given the gravity of the president's misconduct, given the abundance of evidence of his guilt, given the acknowledgement by senators in both parties of that guilt, how have we arrived here with so little common ground? Why was the Nixon impeachment bipartisan? Why was the Clinton impeachment much less so? And why is the gulf between the parties even greater today? It is not for the reason the president's lawyers would have you believe. Although they have claimed many times in many ways that the process in the House was flawed because we did not allow the president to control it, it was in reality little different than the process in prior impeachments. The circumstances, of course, were different. The Watergate investigation began in the Senate and it progressed before it got moving in the House. And there, of course, much of the investigative work had been done by the special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski. 
In Clinton, there was likewise an independent counsel that conducted a multi-year investigation that started with a real estate deal in Arkansas and ended with a blue dress. Nixon and Clinton, of course, played no role in those investigations before they moved to the House Judiciary Committee. But to the degree you can compare the process when it got to the Judiciary Committee in either prior and recent impeachments, it was largely the same as we have here. The President had the right to call witnesses, to ask questions, and chose not to. The House majorities in Nixon and Clinton did not cede their subpoena power to their minorities, and neither did we here. Although then, as now, we gave the minority the right to request subpoenas and to compel a vote, and they did. So the due process the House presided here, provided here was essentially the same and in some ways even greater. Nevertheless, the President's counsel hopes that through sheer repetition, they can convert non-truth into truth. Do not let them. Every single court to hear Mr. Philbin's arguments has rejected them. The subpoenas are invalid, rejected by the McGahn Court. They have absolute immunity, rejected by the McGahn Court. Privilege may conceal crime or fraud, rejected by the court in Nixon. But if the process here was substantially the same, the facts of the president's misconduct were very different from one impeachment to the next. The Republican Party of Nixon's time broke into the DNC and the president covered it up. Nixon too abused the power of his office to gain an unfair advantage over his opponent. But in Watergate, he never sought to coerce a foreign power to aid his reelection nor did he sacrifice our national security in such a palpable and destructive way as withholding aid from an ally at war. And he certainly did not engage in the wholesale obstruction of Congress or justice that we have seen this president commit. The facts of the President Clinton's misconduct pale in comparison to Nixon and do not hold a candle to Donald Trump. Lying about an affair is morally wrong, and when under oath it is a crime, but it had nothing to do with his duties in office. The process being the same, the facts of President Trump's misconduct being far more destructive than either past president, what then accounts for the disparate result in bipartisan support for his removal? What has changed? The short answer is, we have changed. The members of Congress have changed for reasons as varied as the stars the members of this body and ours in the House are now far more accepting of the most serious misconduct of a president as long as it is a president of one's own party. And that is a trend most dangerous for our country. Fifty years ago, no lawyer representing the president would have ever made the outlandish argument that if the president believes his corruption will serve to get him reelected, whether it is by coercing an ally to help him cheat or in any other form that he may not be impeached, that this is somehow a permissible use of his power. But here we are. The argument has been made, and some appear ready to accept it, and that is dangerous, for there is no limiting principle to that position. It must have come as a shock, a pleasant shock to this president, that our norms and institutions would prove to be so weak. The independence of the Justice Department and its formerly proud office of legal counsel, now mere legal tools at the president's disposal to investigate enemies or churn out helpful opinions not worth the paper they are written on. The FBI painted by a president as corrupt and disloyal. The intelligence community not to be trusted against the good counsel of Vladimir Putin. The press portrayed as enemies of the people. The daily attacks on the guardrails of our democracy so relentlessly assailed have made us numb and blind to the consequences. Does none of that matter anymore if he's the president of our party? I hope and pray that we never have a president like Donald Trump in the Democratic Party. 
one that would betray the national interests and the country's security to help with his reelection. And I would hope to God that if we did, we would impeach him and Democrats would lead the way. But I suppose you never know just how difficult that is until you are confronted with it. But you, my friends, are confronted with it. You are confronted with that difficulty now, and you must not shrink from it. History will not be kind to Donald Trump. I think we all know that. Not because it will be written by never Trumpers, but because whenever we have departed from the values of our nation, we have come to regret it. And that regret is written all over the pages of our history. If you find that the House has proved its case and still vote to acquit, your name will be tied to his with a cord of steel and for all of history. But if you find the courage to stand up to him, to speak the awful truth to his rank falsehood, your place will be among the Davids who took on Goliath. If only you will say enough. We revere the wisdom of our founders and the insights they had into self-governance. We scour their words for hidden meaning and try to place ourselves in their shoes. But we have one advantage that the founders did not. For all their genius, they could not see but opaquely into the future. We, on the other hand, have the advantage of time, of seeing how their great experiment in self-governance has progressed. When we look at the sweep of history, there are times when our nation and the rest of the world have moved with a seemingly irresistible force in the direction of greater freedom. More freedom to speak and to assemble, to practice our faith and tolerate the faith of others to love whom we would and choose love over hate. More free societies, walls tumbling down, nations reborn. But then, like a pendulum approaching the end of its arc, the outward movement begins to arrest. The golden globe of freedom reaches its zenith and starts to retreat. The pendulum swings back past the center and recedes into a dark unknown. How much farther it will travel in its illiberal direction, how many more freedoms will be extinguished before it turns back, we cannot say. But what we do here, in this moment, will affect its course and its correction. Every single vote, even a single vote, by a single member, can change the course of history. It is said that a single man or woman of courage makes a majority. Is there one among you who will say, enough? America believes in a thing called truth. She does not believe we are entitled to our own alternate facts. She recoils at those who spread pernicious falsehoods. To her, truth matters. There is nothing more corrosive to a democracy than the idea that there is no truth. America also believes there is a difference between right and wrong, and right matters here. But there is more. Truth matters, right matters, but so does decency. Decency matters. When the president smears a patriotic public servant like Marie Ivanovich in pursuit of a corrupt aim, we recoil. When the president mocks the disabled, a war hero who is a prisoner of war, or a gold star father, we are appalled. Because decency matters here. And when the president tries to coerce an ally to help him cheat in our elections and then covers it up, we must say, enough. Enough. He has betrayed our national security, and he will do so again. He has compromised our elections, and he will do so again. You will not change him. You cannot constrain him. He is who he is. Truth matters little to him. What's right matters even less, and decency matters not at all. I do not ask you to convict him because truth or right or decency matters nothing to him, but because we have proven our case and it matters to you. Truth matters to you. Right matters to you. You are decent. He is not who you are. 
In Federalist 55, James Madison wrote that there were certain qualities in human nature, qualities I believe like honesty, right, and decency, which should justify our confidence in self-government. He believed that we possessed sufficient virtue, that the chains of despotism were not necessary to restrain ourselves from destroying and devouring one another. It may be midnight in Washington, but the sun will rise again. I put my faith in the optimism of the founders. You should too. They gave us the tools to do the job, a remedy as powerful as the evil it was meant to constrain, impeachment. They meant it to be used rarely, but they put it in the Constitution for a reason. For a man who would sell out his country for a political favor. For a man who would threaten the integrity of our elections. For a man who would invite foreign interference in our affairs. For a man who would undermine our national security and that of our allies. For a man like Donald J. Trump. They gave you a remedy and they meant for you to use it. They gave you an oath and they meant for you to observe it. We have proven Donald Trump guilty. Now do impartial justice and convict him. I yield back. The majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent. The Senate sitting in a, as a court, court of impeachment stand adjourned under the previous order. Without objection, so ordered. I suggest the absence of a quorum. everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero. Thanks for joining us. The Senate impeachment trial of President Trump is winding down as the House managers and the president's legal team make their closing arguments. Democrats are urging the Senate to remember the president is not a king and should be held accountable for corruptly using his power to try and cheat in the upcoming election by, Democrats say, illegally upholding aid to Ukraine and then trying to cover it up. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump's lawyers are urging senators to reject the two articles of impeachment to, quote, vindicate the rule of law. They cautioned against weaponizing impeachment as a method of overturning democratically elected presidents. As of this moment, senators supporting the acquittal of the president do have the votes, but the final and official vote on the impeachment articles is expected Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. So let's bring in Zeke Miller and Keir Dougal now. Zeke is a CBSN political contributor and White House reporter for the Associated Press. Keir is a CBSN legal contributor and former assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York. Welcome uh, to both of you for being with us. So, Keir, let's talk about some of the arguments that we heard. I think Schiff there made a very passionate argument for sort of stemming the tide, as it were. He said, you know, if, if we've proven that the president has done these things, as he believes Democrats have, and there are no repercussions for his actions, what is he capable of doing next, Schiff asked. Was that a, you know, a powerful closing argument? Yeah, it, it is a classic argument that a prosecutor would make, and the final call for the Senate to vote to convict him. Um, is sort of the classic way that a prosecutor would end up a an argument that's thematic, that uh, gives an overview and summarizes the evidence. President Trump's counsel had a slightly different chore, which is effectively to provide uh, one reason out of perhaps many that uh, the senators could vote to acquit. Um, I thought that it was a particularly effective argument if you take the view, as the House members do, that the president represents a threat uh, to the elections and to national security, um, you might ask yourself, well, it was July 25th when the call with President Zelensky occurred. That was the day after um, Robert Mueller's testimony um, kind of landed with a thud and ended up, sort of ended the official um, uh, possibility of impeachment directly based on the Mueller report. If the vote in the Senate occurs on Wednesday, as we expect, to acquit, 
um, you might reasonably ask yourself who is the president going to be speaking to on Thursday? That was sort of the, the gist of, of Schiff's argument there, right? What yes. could happen next? So, Zeke, the president's legal team also focused on sort of the larger constitutional concerns, you know, arguing that this is a, you know, a democratically elected president, sort of let the, the people decide, which to back up is something that Senator, you know, Lamar Alexander pointed, pointed out when he said he thought the Democrats made the case that the president's actions were inappropriate, but he said he thought removing the president from office was too extreme a result. He didn't think they warranted impeachment, and that it would also lead to sort of a societal, uh, you know, breakdown. Um, what did you make of the president's legal team's arguments? You know, that, that argument in particular, that there is an election uh, 10 months from now, basically to the day, um, is, is, is essentially uh, a political one being brought, put forward by the, by the president's uh, uh, team there. Obviously, this, is, this impeachment is a, is a parallel track of their legal proceedings and legal strictures that are followed, but then all of this takes place where the, this, the judge and the jury are, are a whole bunch of political senators, and there's also the audience of the people watching around the country who form opinions based upon the evidence that they have seen. And uh, over the last several months, White House officials have been telling reporters over and over and over again that uh, they believe that the, the proximity to the election, uh, it, it was going to be a very powerful defense for them. They, they believe that the president in general has, has sort of created this general uh, um, uh, and not, not necessarily fear, but uh, skepticism of of, of, of establishments um, and institutions. Uh, one of them, including, is, is Congress, uh, and that uh, n nobody, you know, even people who don't support the president, uh, would be would not necessarily be happy with a outcome that involved the, a bunch of uh, senators removing a duly elected president of the United States. Mm -hmm. So that that was the political argument that the president's legal team put forward. Um, that may not necessarily be as, as sound in a legal argument as they were as they were making but uh, at, at the end of the day from the White House's standpoint that doesn't really matter if, the, if they get this the, the enough senators to buy into it and speaking of senators buying into it Keir, you know let's say that there are some Republican senators who sort of quietly said you know yes we sort of agree with Senator Alexander we don't think the president's actions were appropriate but we're still going to vote to acquit because we do not think that they rose to the level of being removed from office is there some middle ground here, though? Is there room for, uh, you know, we talked about earlier how the president has continued to say, I did absolutely nothing wrong, and there's no sense that uh, of contrition at all. Is, is there room for some middle ground where perhaps there would be some statement from a group of Republican senators that say, look, we support him staying in office, but is there room for something like that in this, in this proceeding? Well, I think, sure, there is, because um, this is a political, quasi-political, quasi-legal proceeding. Um, Jonathan Turley, uh, our colleague, made the point um, a day or two ago that as these uh, Republican senators uh, come out, perhaps, as Lamar Alexander uh, did, and acknowledge or agree with the House managers that there was some wrongdoing here, you effectively get to a constructive censure. So um, censure being a uh, vote by a majority of one or the other houses um, saying what the president did was wrong. Um, but the contrition point is, is an important one be, because it, to come back to the question that we, that we you know, what, what happens on Thursday, if the president is continuing to say that he did absolutely nothing wrong in the face of all of this evidence, you don't have the catharsis of uh, perhaps if you could believe the president that he would adjust his conduct that right. he wouldn't do it again um, you know that may, it may be naive to think um, if you if you believe uh, Adam Schiff that this president is 100 percent going to do it again you might not be able to believe that uh, con express contrition by the president but it it would at least be an opening right all right so Zeke I do want to play a soundbite from House impeachment manager Val Demings she argues the Trump legal team's arguments are hypocritical based on the actions of the president's own Justice Department. So let's listen. The president's argument is as shameless as it is hypocritical. 
The President's counsel is arguing in this trial that the House should have gone to court to enforce its subpoenas, while at the same time, the President's own Department of Justice is arguing in court that the House could not enforce the subpoenas through the courts. And you know what remedy they say in court is available to the House? Impeachment for obstruction of Congress. So, Zeke, can you break that down a little bit for us? In what cases is the president's Justice Department arguing the House is not enforcing subpoenas? That's the, the biggest one is the McGahn case there, um, which uh, has been efforts by House committees to to, uh, to get get the former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify, and to, it's an investigation that stemmed out of the the Mueller probe um, and oversight of that uh, that uh, that has sort of been sort of. Now taken over in a way by the uh, insignificance by uh, this impeachment uh, inquiry and, uh, and and the president's impeachment. Um, you know, and, and the challenge there is that you know, the White House, White House attorneys have spent you know the last several weeks hammering away at the notion that they claim that the subpoenas issued by the House. Um, at least early in the impeachment investigation, uh, were, uh, were, were improperly formed because they were not approved by the full House. That ultimately did happen at the end of October, uh, but uh, the White House has argued that the subpoenas issued before then were therefore invalid and could not be enforced. Um, and that, that, you know, and that, and that if, the, if the House wanted to do that, they can go to, they can go to the courts to, to, to try to, to litigate that. Um, that's, that's, part, that's one element there. You know, it, it is a little bit circular and, and confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, the point, and, the, and the points that the, the, white, that the Trump administration has been raising in, 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 you know, in the federal courts is that, they, is that Congress can use impeachment as a remedy if, if an administration is not, uh, does, not necessarily compl does not comply with subpoenas. So both sides have, have certainly a leg to stand on here, and it is one of those, those you know, they're one of those situations where there may not be a perfect answer. These are, you know, two uh, immensely powerful branches of government that have uh, competing equities, and there is not necessarily a, an, uh, a right and a wrong in all circumstances there, and they, they will always be in tension potentially as the as you know, as they are right now right. and potentially in future investigations going forward. Well, Keir, I certainly thought it was a dramatic moment when Adam Schiff directly pointed at Attorney General William Barr and accused him of heading a Justice Department that is no longer independent. What did you think of that moment? I think it's a, a significant concern. Um, Bill Barr is mentioned in the call uh, transcript, the summary of the call. Um, I believe that um, Lev Parnas has also indicated that uh, Bill Barr had involvement in, uh, in this uh, scheme that's alleged by the House. Well, little asterisk on Mr. Parnas, uh, we have to take his testimony with a grain of salt uh, because he uh, is under indictment and he is apparently hasn't been accepted as a cooperator. But why Bill Barr has not recused himself um, is, uh, is uh, concerning right. under these circumstances. And so, you know, Zeke, we have seen a number of polls showing that Americans overwhelmingly wanted to see witnesses, including in particular among independents. Is the White House concerned about angering voters outside of the president's base? Are the Republican senators at all concerned about alienating some of their constituents over this? There, I haven't heard really any of that talking to White House officials and as a Republican strategist of the last month or two as this sort of this debate crystallized. Um, the, the prevailing theory at the White House is that the only pe people who will remember impeachment um, come Election Day will be uh, hyper partisans on both sides. And they believe that their partisans, the, the Trump base, will uh, be activated and motivated by this uh, more so than Democrats will be, uh, because the, the president seems to be, you know, is, is uh, on the on the cusp of uh, on the cusp of, uh, of acquittal, and that that will be a, pl a powerful motivator for his supporters, and that the folks in the middle, you know, they'll remember the president was impeached. They'll remember a, a very a complicated uh, legal trial. They'll remember nothing came of it really, and then they have all sorts of issues that they care about that matter to their daily lives and that are more important to them than the ins and outs and the nitty gritty of, of an impeachment trial. That's sort of the the White the White House's working theory of the case here. Um, that may be put to the test over the next couple of months, but uh, it, from the, the, their reading on the polling is, 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 is you know, to, is the procedural things can, will, will be in the past and, and everything else will be in the future. Now, Kier, while the president will almost certainly be acquitted, he has been, tweet, tweet, he tweeted recently uh, about being exonerated. 
Those two things are not exactly the same, correct? Can you explain the legal distinction? Right. So the question before the Senate is going to be um, guilty or not guilty, proven or not proven. Um, but a vote that the House hasn't proven its case, perhaps to the high burden of proof that individual senators will weigh the evidence against, does not mean that the president has been found innocent. Um, or exonerated in the sense that um, the, the Senate has concluded that there's nothing wrong. That's as a legal matter. As a political matter, I would fully expect the president to use that word mm -hmm. um, if he is uh, not convicted or found uh, proven guilty at the Senate trial. And so there is no way that this process can exonerate him, correct? As a technical uh, legal matter, um, no, that's not the purpose of this. It's to determine whether or not the House has met its burden of proof to show guilt. Right. Okay, so Zeke, the president tweeted as Democrats were making their arguments, demanding to know where the whistleblower is, once again, hurling accusations at House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff and so on. He has pushed his Justice Department to open counter investigations, as we know, most notably into the origins of the Russia investigation. So, Zeke, do you expect him to do the same here? I mean, especially we know he's going to be acquitted, which will definitely, you know, boost his confidence if it needs any boosting. Uh, do you think that he will sort of lash out in the same way at the Democrats who he thinks are most responsible for this? As a political matter, absolutely. The president's sort of rhetoric uh, that we've seen over the last several months, he believes, has been very effective with his base. And I think it's a safe bet to say, uh, to suggest that that will continue. Um, w w will he sort of direct uh, investigations into the origins here? Um, for, for instance, the whistleblower complaint and how that was treated. Uh, there have certainly been rumblings among uh, Democrats, uh, sorry, excuse me, Republicans, uh, uh, particularly the president's allies, to do that. Um, in, in, in large part, one of the reasons why the president initially won witnesses in this trial, and the reason why there weren't, were, were no witnesses was because Mitch McConnell did not want them, the president kind of did, uh, was because he wanted to do just that. He wanted a public airing uh, of, of, of grievances and, and, and allow, allowing his allies to start, try to tar um, so, some of the Democrats involved and the, and, uh, the whistle, intelligence community whistleblower whose complaints sparked all of this. So we could see some attempts at oversight on that front. But uh, it, it's hard to see the Department of Justice making uh, making any headway on there uh, on on that front because that's the sort of thing that.